for having me, and it was great. And um, um, Eric, and, and I'll see you guys soon. And um, thank you for my thank you for the students. You guys did some great work, and then thank you for my fellow jurors. You guys were also great for having me. Hi, Adam. And hi, Adam. Um, um, and, and I'll see you guys soon. You bet. And, um, thank you for my thank you, for Adam. The students. You guys did some great work, and then thank you for my fellow jurors. You guys were also great for having me. Hi, Adam. And, um, and um, I, Adam. And, and I'll see you guys soon. You bet. And, uh, Thank you so much. Let's um, let's keep rolling. You're completely <clears throat> live now. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lodovico Moscadelli, and uh, I had a pleasure to work with uh, Alejandro Loaiza. And uh, we're working on this project today with Sotobosco, which uh, the translation of Sotobosco is pretty much the effect, that, uh, the lighting effect that you get if you're under a that's sort of a uh, the sort of transparency where the light hits the three ramification system. And I'll pass it on to Alejandro just to briefly explain the concept and move on. Thank you, Lodovico. So uh, the project is born out of the premise that at any given point in time, uh, different organisms will be interacting with the same structure sim simultaneously. Uh, being a project that would interact with animals and humans alike, we chose to combine elements um, that represented human beings and elements that were more akin to marine life. Can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, for the marine aspect, we chose to go with a type of sponge that is found at the bottom of the ocean, which is called a glass sponge. Uh, what caught, caught our eye the most about this organism is that it looks uh, very different than other sponge species. Uh, it grows in a very distinctive geometric pattern that resembles more a, of a man-made structure, uh, rather like a scaffolding, rather than a, than a marine creature. To represent the human aspect, can you go to the next slide? Sorry. Uh, to represent the human aspect, we chose to go with uh, an architectural element that was very widely used uh, in the past in Gothic architecture uh, is the fan vault. So uh, the reasons for the reason for this choice uh, was pretty much the same reason why uh, we chose to go for the um, glass sponge. Um, kind of like the the opposite, really. Uh, it looks uh, like a man-made. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a man-made structure that looks. Uh, that has a very organic quality to it and resembles more uh, a tree, right? Or, or it resembles more of a coral rather than, than a vault. So uh, the abstraction of the fan vault becomes the structural part of the project. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, the abstraction of the fan vault becomes the structural part of the project, which is composed of tubes or pipes uh, that come out of the water in the form of stems and then branch out forming uh, some sort of uh, petals, as you can see in the image to the far right. Um, for the, the material that we chose for the tubes, uh, for the structural part, uh, is bio rock. Um, it is composed of different minerals uh, that react to the electrolyzation of water. Um, and with time become as hard and durable as concrete. Next slide, please. Um, so the glass sponge becomes the envelope of the, of the structure and it contrasts, contrasts with the roughness and solidity of the pipes while also providing more surface for animals like birds or squirrels uh, to use the structure for their own needs. Uh, so as you can see in this picture, uh, the units uh, um, you know, the, the, the very um, smaller element of the structure is, you know, these units, this for, uh, sort of petals that uh, when put together and connected to other units, they form a superstructure that ultimately creates uh, this environment that brings together all the different organisms into one single space. And then uh, uh, when we were given the site, 
Um, we wanted to get back to our uh, main idea that uh, each of these modules are connected to each other. And uh, as you can see in uh, the structural diagrams, each of them, uh, it's uh, supported by the other module. That, that uh, sort of entire forest idea that we're trying to recreate. And uh, in, the, in the site section, when we first saw the site, uh, when we put it our module, uh, our main idea was uh, sort of uh, uh, to create a sort of utopia uh, that would kind of recreate a sort of a perfect mix for the flora and fauna and the, of different species. And uh, then we kind of started looking at different perspective of, uh, of different uh, species. So in uh, the, the, the next images, you'll be able to see, again, like the perspective of uh, a fish that it's uh, swimming around the module and the way that the um, module is filtrating the sunlight. Or in this situation, it's the way of how the module comes out and meet the human being, uh, sort of uh, transforming itself to create some sort of pods where humans will be able to use them uh, and also for other people to uh, explore the actual uh, module. Um, or again, in this, it would be more of like the, board, the bird uh, point of view. In this situation, we wanted to kind of visualize this as a place where uh, animals or in this situation, birds would be able to meet, uh, I mean, not meet, but rest uh, on, on our structure. And so then- you, uh, you know what the bird will do to your structure, right? I'm sorry? You know what the bird will do to your structure, right? Uh, the Merda project? The, the, the Piero Manzoni will pack it, but he will do it. Okay, <laughs> keep going. And, um, and then we kind of looked at this sort of um, aspect where on up under the water it would be growth by coral, but outside it would be growth by actual vegetation, kind of creating a surreal aspect of element of like the human being not being there anymore and uh, the vegetation taking over the entire uh, uh, structure elements and project. And uh, this is, and then we also kind of look at other ways of looking at it, uh, more of like a art installment in this situation, uh, especially more because the site uh, at night is really uh, dark. And by right now recreating the Miami Vice Scholars, we actually wanted to um, Re recreate like a sort of art installment for people to go visit during the night and also uh, illuminate the entire space. And lastly, but not least, is the most important aspect or a factor of this project, which would be how Cora would be um, into uh, how the corals will actually take advantage of our uh, module to grow mm -hmm. later on, populate the entire. Um, entire um, proposal and uh, we have a video on youtube but uh if you want i can share the link or i can share it via i think you can share it uh, right now via zoom like you just press play on the on the video oh, let me do this. hopefully the connection will be good a little jagged but we we get the idea okay sorry keep going keep going yeah and uh, that would be all thank you thank you Well, everybody's quiet, so I'm just going to express my feeling. It felt very good. So I was in movement. I was feeling, you know, continuity. I was feeling I could be snorkeling and coming out, and diving and coming out. And, and the sense of that continuity within the ecosystems, but providing a completely different. So you are using the same structure, but it's going to be colonized by completely different organisms. 
However, that continuity is felt. So I, I don't feel that you tried to use the inspiration, you know, from, well, the sponge is kind of within, isn't it? That the sponges are beautiful around this because of how they actually form the, and the strength, how they can support that biomass just based on those tiny spicules and the shape they have. So, and in terms of biology, I think that you, again, as one of the previous um, projects, you are providing the substrate to be taken by other organisms. And you're providing enough heterogeneity. And from, you know, a normal lay person that doesn't know anything about architecture, it feels good, it feels weird, it feels extraterrestrial. However, being very, very accommodating to land. So uh, I, I think that is a quite word, maybe honest yeah. to do, that is not going to be trying to bring nature out, but to provide something that is very weird that is going to be colonized by nature and creating a completely new, different sense of space. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, Eric, um, this is Charles here from Australia. Oh, it's been, it's really great to see the presentations and um, I've had a series of thoughts uh, building um, which have been taken up by some of the jury. So um, I, I think we should take your pelican story seriously, and that's, so this is my way way in really to to talk about uh, I guess time in these projects, and I think it'd be really because all the projects uh, sort of are situating themselves in a in a very particular place with very particular ecological uh, forces at play, and I think the story of the pelican is really to the point because it's a story that. Um, shows how um, man-made structures, I guess, are adapted and taken advantage of by different uh, uh, organisms alike, I suppose. And but the, these are things that happen over time. So the accretion of bird shit on the on the boat tarpaulins, you know, happens over particular periods of time. And and I, I'd really uh, like to hear from the students, and certainly something for them to think about as they go forward about how their projects, um, I guess, evolve over time. Cause they, in the way that they're uh, represented, I guess, they, they, they look all as if they're instantaneous, they just appear. So I'd like to hear some thoughts about how they would actually grow, how they'd be put in place and then how they would um, evolve over time and to take into account the very particular forces at play. So with one of the previous projects, it was, it was mentioned that there were, you know, for example, intertide, this place is uh, intertidal. So how do these structures perform in a relationship to uh, a situation which is changing all the time and how, how these, uh, are these structures um, designed to um, engage with that change over time and to allow certain things to happen? And importantly, uh, I know from Eric's contribution to our studios, this thing about messiness, how, how, does, how do these things actually um, uh, allow the messiness of life or how do they uh, uh, engage or facilitate that and how, how do they then not look so pristine all the time? Because they're not going to be pristine. They're going to get overgrown. They're going to get it shat on. They're going to be eaten away at. You know, things are going to peck at them. And in particularly in the ones in the sea, the tide, the forces of the tide are going to do weird and strange things to them. And that would be really great to see in the projects about how, how they're perhaps designed to um, engage with those forces and change over time. Um, so. I, I just want, I have to say something. Thank you, Charles. Uh, the, the questions, any questions to me about time, anything but being on a hurry, let's say, but any, any other than, being on a hurry, any questions about time, I, I, I love, you know, and I think it's really interesting, it's given that I'm working on a project called Feedback. But I think that um, 
I just only wanted to ask Lodovico, and then maybe this gets you talking. What was the name that uh, we said? You said uh, it's used for uh, in Italian for ruins. Uh, for ruins. Uh, wait, now I'm having. Uh, uh, ruins, it's the uh, rovine. 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 Lovely word. Because I thought that's kind of also what you're doing. You're just starting. Uh, I was reminded of the work of the uh, metabolists, um, especially Arata Isosaki, when he was creating these uh, megastructures and, and these wonderful um, uh, interchangeable parts that would come in and plug in and plug out out of uh, really big uh, megastructures, uh, taking on the notion of metabolism, kind of adapting it to architecture. He was also providing in his drawings the view of that thing already in ruins. And people were wondering why. You know? I think that it's, it's the same question about this project. It's already providing the ruins of itself. Uh, partially, I think that's um, fascinating, but it's also something that needs to be processed very carefully moving forward. OK, so uh, can I say something? Yeah. Um, first of all, Ludovico Alejandro, I really want to congratulate with you. I saw your project at the, uh, I don't know if it was a midterm because actually it's a long, it's a year long program, but uh, last time you have done an impressive amount of work and the project evolved so in, in, in a really great direction. So congratulations, the visual are amazing. And uh, I'm so happy to see, to see the students progressing uh, uh in, in in such a radical way so congratulations to you and to eric as, as well uh i remember at the beginning uh, when you started your project there was this problem be be between um, biomimetics and biomorphism but then you have been playing around you with your system structures and shapes so much that actually you 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 break from the, those references and you created your own uh, uh, original uh, system structure object. Call it as you want. Depends on your intellectual and theoretical reference. Um, so I, I I really don't uh, don't know what to say, uh, but that perhaps. Uh, uh, your system uh, could, I mean, you could try to understand if there are qualities that you didn't investigate uh, while your system goes underground. So you have a, basically above the water, you have under the water. So I guess that perhaps there was this uh, question that rise at a certain point about the fact that uh, it could become sort of a sort of root system oh. that could uh, work as an anchor in a sort of way. I don't know. I don't know. But that's just my only thing that you may explore as a as a potential uh, quality, as a potentiality of your project and your system. It's just like they are like overgrown flowers too. You know, the talus went too long and they began to kind of flip over. So, but I think that's awesome to be to think of. What happens when because in miami it's so flat nobody thinks about building uh, underground garages therefore nobody thinks there is anything below the ground that we walk on right but maybe we can change that i think it's a fantastic suggestion yeah when i when i was sitting underground i was really thinking about the underground of the underwater <laughs> so oh really underground <laughs> so the yeah exactly okay yeah maybe we can i can add a short, a short comment to it. Um, again, also, I would like to say the same like Nicolo. I think the work is amazing. It's beautifully presented. The representation and quality is amazing. The images are gorgeous. So congratulations to that. I, I don't want to go down the route to discuss this as a biomorphic project. I'd rather like to discuss this as, as the idea of what it, what it means in terms of architecture and how it's actually positioned within a lineage of architecture. I mean, I think the prototypical architecture that is obsessed with lines and bundles of lines is the Gothic, right? Where they actually really un understood how those lines are basically providing a physical representation of forces that are flowing within the architectural entity. And I think something similar is happening here. 
and it could be exploited in a more clear and forward way. And another, I mean, other things that come to mind, which is really interesting, also in terms of architectural representation, is, is how, for example, the Egyptians depicted their columns as, as papyri. Like they had, even, even the, the morphology of your architecture has relationships with that sort of proximity to the papyri flower and how that is represented. It, it somehow weirdly resonates. It's an architectural possibility to read what you have been doing here outside and, and, and biologically, morphologically idea. And then another thing that I thought was really interesting was uh, when Nicolo mentioned ruins or the ruination of a project. I think that's also something that comes to mind here because considering what I just said before, like the, the Egyptian column, the way how lines were used in the Gothic, you are creating the ruination of that idea. Yeah, I think that's quite an interesting problem to have and something to build on in terms of not only uh, a possibility to discuss your project in an, in an, let's say, theoretical frame of architectural inquiry. And architecture has an obsession for ruins. I mean, there's nothing new. I, there's, for example, the, the Roman ruin in Schoenbrunn Garden, which was intentionally designed and built as a ruin. Yeah? For, for example, the representation of the Bank of England, which is quite famous from the 19th century, as a ruin. Yeah, so there is like a lineage of thinking also in terms of the ruin as something that is part of the architectural product. Because at some point it will be a ruin. So this idea of time, Eric also pointed it out, the idea of actually including time as a possibility to discuss architecture and the ruin to be part of the history of the architecture, not just the perfect result when it was built, is a really interesting thought. And I would really encourage you guys to, to you know, poke a little bit more into that direction. Thank you. Yeah, Matthias, um, <clears throat> it, it, in landscape, of course, there's the whole tradition of the picturesque and the and the role of the ruin in the in picturesque gardens. So, so it's a kind of very interesting thing to think about. There's also um, been a number of exhibition projects, at least in here in Australia. One of which um, was called Ruins of the Future. So, in a funny sort of way, for me, it's kind of like a Back to the Future moment, where these things were sort of explored both in the 19th century, but also in or the late 1990s, you know, last century, if you like. So, so yeah, the the ruin is a very interesting thing. That that was partly, I guess, what I was going to get to with the idea about the engagement with time. I think uh, this project uh, really brings up, and and with the past uh, projects, how how these, what is the relationship of these projects with our thinking about you know, duration of projects, uh, particularly of man-made things in relationship to the continuing organic life on the planet, I guess. You know, just bringing a perspective from underwater, we tend to see, uh, in particular, this image and others, and when we see restoration programs, they can sink boats and they can sink different kinds of things, isn't it? And who cares about architecture? And the feeling is that it's something rotten and it's the color, even the color that you're providing. But thinking in time, this is going to become something so alive that is nothing but a ruin, nothing to do with the ruin, isn't it? So that is going to be the two different perspectives. If you are a living thing, you are just becoming and taking life and producing life. And that through time is not going to be a ruin. It's going to be something very new, very vibrant. And that might be something very interesting to explore when you are doing these projects. What is your perspective of structures above, um, above water, not above ground, but above water, what is the perspective and how do you see the transformation of, what, of your projects within that perspective that is completely different? Uh, and in that terms of evolution as well, when life take over human structures, is that the ruin? I, I just want to bring that, you know, uh, from, from the biological perspective, we are creating something completely new, vibrant. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I like the emphasis on... on um vitality in that and uh it avoids what i think you know the, the uh, melancholy of the picturesque project you know like victorian melancholia over ruins i think that's that's really a great suggestion yeah it's because also you know i i usually live vicariously through colin ford's uh, um, uh diving videos and all these amazing things he captures when he he forays out there and but oftentimes there's this uh very um uh, prosaic things such as shopping carts 
or car wheels or these typical things that that a core of seems to um, not reject on the contrary it seems to like it and thrive on it. and um, so therefore it, there's nothing um, uh, these are very prosaic mundane things that you can make a world under water of so might as well just do it with uh, some sort of funky looking architecture yeah, um, I think that that uh, yeah then we can move sorry <laughs> just last oh, thing no, I, I, I think it's uh, perhaps a, a, a nice term for this project could be also decadent because it's you combine this sort of ruin and decaying uh, system with the, the emergence uh, of the emergence of new life so you there are people that see new life growing on it and then people that see their the, the life that is decaying and it's the perfect actually definition of uh, of a decadent uh, uh, system you know that is uh, at the same time you know decaying and emergent so i think it's uh, it has this uh, peculiar quality um, i have to agree with all of those comments but also I, as someone who's worked in the green sustainable space for 30 years now i think it it, there's a joyousness to um, what I see here, particularly above the water, uh, that I think could create a, what we desire, which is a level of engagement with the public uh, to conquer the hearts and minds of people. So many have a good intention to help with the environment, but to actually interact with it, uh, to engage and to take action, that's the really difficult part. And I can imagine installations or projects like these drawing throngs of people in, you know, popular vacation areas. So good work. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let's uh, then invite now uh, Anna and Carla. Yes. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hola. Hi. Um, this is. Yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carla Cabrera, and my partner is Ana Moreno, and this is our ongoing development project called Regenera. However, perhaps such a real and self-complete unity is the aggregate of all species which have gradually evolved from one and the same common form. So this quote by Ernst Haeckel sparked the idea of incorporating the evolution of species and corals into our design. So in other words, our design aims to bring to life the evolutionary trajectory of corals. Our philosophy is based on the concept of particular evolution, which focuses on the changes the species undergoes according to geographical patterns and how they change over evolutionary time. Um, this illustration to the far left is a diagrammatic interpretation of how the of the trajectory of particular evolution. And since the idea implies that the process under is under physical environmental control, maybe the easiest way to interpret this is by realizing that there are three constantly repeated patterns, which include the family, the genera, and the species. And referring back to what I just mentioned, the making and the breaking of this genetic context are a result of the ocean currents, whereas the particles start to break apart and go from the family to the genera to the species, and then they find their way back to other species, creating new families or going extinct due to genetic isolation. So going back to the starting quote and connecting it to our concept, we illustrate the idea that life starts from one and the same common form, but however, per, there is no time or space of origin during evolution, time and space do take place. So geographic and evolutionary time interact where species may break apart and then reform into slightly different units, creating a reticulate pattern in both the geographical space and the evolutionary time. 
these are some of the initial sketches that we did uh, for our design. And we then say that evolution equals form, where we start creating the form based on the already explained trajectory of reticular evolution and the components of families, the genera and species by creating the making and breaking of this genetic context in the design. And in this table, uh, we can see the idea of how the reticular evolution is interpreted in our thought process, where we start with a series of genotypes, which are the modules individual collections of genes, and how they start to create a generic connectivity that is then uh, influenced by the environment and the wave trajectory of the location in which the module will be deployed in order to create the phenotype where some of their traits are determined by the genotypes and others are by the environmental factors. Um, in this singular module, uh, it's created to artificially curate nature that will foster and simulate biodiversity through the transformation of the natural marine habitat. In these pictures, uh, we show a prototype that we actually did. So we 3D printed in a one-third scale um, in order to efficiently and physically see the designs and how it can potentially be printed in concrete. And this is our vision of the module. And then our design proved the capability of the module to actually adapt and become to life and grow in order to optimize itself to serve the natural marine habitat in which it is placed. And the module begins to connect by the loose species that we can see uh, in the structure, which starts to evolve and create possible new reef formations. They begin to cultivate a diverse set of structures that start to evolve and create the new structural patterns. Mm. And here we see the module criteria, which is determined by its material um, the weight and its pores and the skeletal structure. So now we begin with the module's deployment, which is in south of Fifth Miami Beach. And the deployment and the layout of the modules, um, like stated before, is highly influenced by the specific environmental factors in the site which are in which it's placed. And these factors include the sun exposure, the topography, and the ocean currents. This is a site with some dimensions that helped like scale our design. Um, here is a top view, which is includes the design and layout in, that is formed by different interconnected mutations, and then the sorry interconnected mutations of the module that vary in features such as height, size, rotation, including others that help optimize the module in the specific site. And the environmental factors made it evident that there was a need for a shoreline buffer um, because of the high wave patterns that were created from the canal. Um, a maximized module placement was also created in the north area of the site because of the sun exposure. And an open area with minimal module engagement is meant for bigger species to interact with the site. In this section, you can start to appreciate the different gradients and, and densities in the modules and which start to evolve and create spaces for human interfaces. So new potential architectural types can begin to generate and engage the new underwater structure and promote a new type of urban environmental experience for humans and non-humans. And these are possible future environments of, where the module can start to be studied and deployed um, for maximum optimization in order to like regenerate the evolutionary process of, of creating the families and providing new homes for coral reefs around the world. And now we wanna conclude with a small video.
this um, concludes our, our design. Thank you. Thank you. It's pretty amazing. But it looked, uh, <clears throat> it's something that I can very easily imagine knowing this site really well uh, as it currently exists. Um, I feel like you guys did a really good job thinking about a lot of different factors um, and created something that is quite complete without being too busy for no good reason. I feel like it has a very kind of like, it's a very futuristic, uh, has a very futuristic feel for something that is you know quite ancient, which I think is kind of like a, a nice uh, kind of collaboration of, of, of new and old, which speaks to the space and time of coral evolution. And, and um, I would love to, you know, I like how you've, you've kind of created observation decks for people to, actually engage with and look at you know, what's going on under the water. So um, yeah, great, great job. Thank you. Yeah, um, really, uh, really some great ideas and uh, beautifully represented. And um, I particularly like um, at the start how you, um, I guess, start thinking about ocean currents and particu the particularity of the environment that you're designing. And so I like that. Sort of jumping right to the end, what, what it seems to me, and this is maybe this is partly because of my landscape architecture background, but part of your proposition seem, seems to suggest that, um, that what your project can uh, do is to rethink edge conditions between land and sea. At the moment, it, it, it appears sort of uh, an add-on to, I guess, the existing constructed edge. But what it seems to suggest that you're in thinking about how you can um, engage with uh, other, other life forms and to uh, um, prioritize their life cycles, et cetera, and to evolve marine uh, ecologies it suggests that you have to, in fact, change the way that we construct the edge conditions between land and land and marine environments. Uh, th for me, that seems to be one really very interesting direction that your your project suggests. That in order to do this, in order to uh, now really work seriously with ecologies and with other life forms, we have to rethink the way we construct uh, edge conditions between uh, land and sea. So I think that would be something very interesting for you to explore. And I guess the other thing that I have in mind with, and, and it's not just your, your project, but it's uh, all the others is, is um, you have, I'd like to see how you've, you've tested your, the, the forms that you, like your modules. So for example, I, and I keep having in mind, not just the, uh, uh, issues, I guess, of optimization, because we had some questions around the use of that word, but you set up particular constraints or, I guess, um, design generators for your module, um, but we only see one sort of version of that. So it could be interesting to know uh, how you've tested the, against those constraints for the performance of your, to sort of optimize, I guess, the performance of your module. So, and I, and so there's porosity, but there's also, I keep on thinking about the texture and the, the, because if, if you go back to your original um, uh, inspiration, I guess, that how uh, corals and marine life, um, uh, uh, their life forms are facilitated by different kinds of texturing and different kinds of porosity at different scales. Um, I, I'd be interested to know what you've tested and why this particular form is the best iteration uh, of the module so far. Um, so how we started designing our module, it was based on the, on the genetic or like diagrammatic interpretation of the concept, which was reticular evolution, which starts, um, we stated for the, like the, the family, the genera, and the species, and that's how we started to create our form based on 
that concept and then um, we started like seeing what structures were maybe like too porous, what um, they would withhold like like the ocean currents and stuff like that. And we started um, just, we did like a, a, a few iterations which include like all of these and we were just trying to see which ones were working best together and then we started like polishing them and we chose um, this final one. And then this one would be edited and mutated in order to fit the specific site. So this um, this module then starts like mutating and rotating and just like moving around and shifting in order to well, optimize its function in that specific site. If I, if I may add to what um, Carla is yeah. saying, it's sort of like almost like quoting Nicolo, this, the project is more um, vested in a sort of philosophical position, sort of pseudo pseudo philosophical position. It could be any form, quite frankly. But what's interesting is that they are looking at things like I show them at least during the process, um, the co-adaptations and the sort of co-opting of, um, of um, limbs that find no use, which then co -op, get, get co-opted either by the creature or by the environment that surrounds the creature. So they were looking at this idea of these, all these little tail ends that, that don't seem to go anywhere and how those are the opportunities for either the module to evolve or for the module to co-evolve with the other modules that get connected to it through, the, through that or that force that thing to become something else. So I think this is sort of like very dynamic potential um, uh, living thing in the very nature of how these mo uh, modules are conceived. They are static, but who is to say that we can discover a material that is not static? Um, I, I really love this project and uh, for a simple reason, and it is, uh, at least to me, a really elegant project. And uh, elegance, okay, is an old concept. Is a, that's an old co discussion. But to me, it's uh, being elegant as a designer is still really important, and it's not easy at all. And uh, and I think that it's uh, it's really your project. It's really successful in uh, in being elegant. I really appreciate the change in intricacy between the. Uh, underwater condition and um, above the water condition and the fact that at a certain point your system again changes in intricacy but also in the moment it, it is above the water it starts uh, integrating uh, uh, human food functions it becomes balconies it becomes sitting it becomes uh, railing and that's really uh, well done, well designed, well organized, uh, really well controlled. So, congratulations. Thank you. I have to agree, very Thank elegant, you. very beautiful. And as someone who actually 3D prints concrete, and we've been running tests on 3D printing coral forms for quite a while, what I see here is pretty germane to our process. And having shown samples to both Eric and Colin, in the past, I think they both commented that the rugosity of our material is pretty suitable for underwater use, and I think we can achieve the forms above ground as well, or at least we'd, we'd be excited to try at some point. But I thought it was it was both a, a practical and beautiful project and appeared to be using generative design very, uh, very intelligently. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Here comes some concepts that maybe we can uh, discuss a little about because the, the here comes the, the the term futuristic, elegant, beautiful, nature and human. Um, from one side, uh, well, uh, if it's elegant or futuristic, uh, the question is: um, this have more value? Because when Eric speak about Manzoni's shit. Uh, the last time that uh, one of these uh, Manzoni sheets was in the market uh, comes 
until 275,000 euros, a little box of uh, Manzoni shit. And uh, nobody will say that it's futuristic or, or, or elegant or something. So we can see what, what happens with values and, and, uh, and interest, because the interest maybe uh, have to do with intelligence, but if if our um, if they agree with concepts of elegant or beautiful or or futuristic, from one side I think that uh, Colin is telling about futuristic because he see uh, continuity of aerodynamical white forms, and this uh, becomes in the imaginarium of of all uh, humans. I was making a lot of years ago. Uh, a big, big um, encuesta, what is in English, encuesta? Um, well, the, the, yeah, in a, with, uh, I think, more than 2,000 people in Barcelona asking about what is more futuristic, the Tower of Calatrava or the Tower of Foster in Barcelona? You know, they have two towers. All the people was identified futuristic as the Tower of Calatrava because it's white and with continuous forms. And not and not as the the tower of Foster that uh, looks more um, more um, technological. Yeah. Uh, um, but from the other side, um, um, nature is is not so clean. So um, and when Carla and Anna are speaking about nature and and humans. Um, we find it elegant and beautiful and futuristic and, and uh, it's nice. I, I love also this project, but um, we love it because it's so clean, so white, so perfect in the forms, in the continuity. And nature all the time has the contrary, has the pelican shit and the, 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 the discontinuities and, and contradictions. Um, that here we we don't ask about contradictions. So um, if you introduce, because you are you was very good speaking about this the the about the, the genetic and all this the, the evolution and all these things. Um, um, so, but um, at the end you are also following um, a, 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 so a, a little. Um, um, mistakes in the evolution of, of, of your own forms because you don't let to 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 become really mm, with with external forces that that introduce uh, uh, this kind of discontinuities and, and of not clean image but it's curious because humans love this kind of very clean images and and I think you 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 are elegant and beautiful because uh, the, the project, because the, the, um, the, the continuity, uh, the, the, the diversity, the, varia the, the variation of the forms that mm, makes that you don't, it's difficult that you find exactly the module that you are repeating. It's not so easy mm, because you introduce all these complexities. So this makes us this feeling of, of, of happiness. I get what you're saying. I think it's really, really interesting what you're saying. I, I, um, it resonates a lot with some of us that I have because it's actually a perverse project because even the, the, the mere mention of the pelicans, they actually shit white. So that's even more interesting. But the comedy I find very attractive because in fact, there's a lot, some people, if these were not white or if we, if we sort of take that out of the equation, some people might find this gross and, and violent and sort of like extremely disorderly and chaotic. But there's something about the way you handle, there's an elegance in the way in which things interplay that makes it um, agreeable, whatever is the word is to me, is, I'm indifferent to the, the terms. I, if anything, I'm interested in affect perhaps and to help try to tease out what kind of affect this is, which Alberto is uh, beginning to uncover, because there is a certain set of affects here at play. And the fact that it's being whitewashed, it's even more perverse in a certain way than beautiful. But I think that um, 
something to consider is that we're designing for time, right? So it's about time to come to terms with the fact that this is just only a substratum for lots of things to grow on, and they will grow on and adhere to and accrue in the form of what you have, um, and the form, the perception of it as well. You're showing some renders underwater for that, but um, but I, going back, I think I do like the idea that it's presented in a super clean way, but it's, it's everything but that. It's erotic, it's violent, it's charged, and yet it's presented in a way that is subdued and almost minimalist, right? I find that sort of um, in itself a juxtaposition resolved in a seamless way. But I, going back to Alberto's comments, I think it's really important to think about something we discussed also with uh, Tom and Charles Anderson in the review, the idea of building in resistances. And so we need more resistances here to be built into the project. And I think that we can come up with several um, to, to make it even more jarring and more interesting. Uh, I, I just add one last thing, if uh, at least <laughs> for my comments. It's, uh, I think it is uh, the, the, the idea of elegance and beauty came also from uh, uh, the word that you just said, Eric, that is uh, minimalistic but complex. So it is a sort of minimalistic complexity, which uh, I think it is uh, an interesting uh, uh, definition. Right? In, and and but there is still i mean to me it was elegant in the, in the change of intricacy and the changing condition between uh, the what is above and below the water at least in the moment it becomes intricate and more complex and uh, less controlled in a way you have the water that it acts as uh, an, an, an opalescent surface that actinate the sort of way as you were saying that's uh, pulsion that is uh, uh, embedded within that complexity yeah I, I just it, i might be repeating myself but i think i think um one of the reasons why it look, you know, we have this idea that it's elegant and be um, beautiful is that it's, I think it's, I think it's been, I guess, situated or the integration with sight is, um, uh, dare I say, it's somewhat ornamental. So again, the, the uh, for me, it would be uh, not be so polite about existing, you know, business as usual approaches to a project like this and to really to take the fundamentals of your thinking as being necessities for having to again think about how you have to redesign the interrelationships between aquatic and land environments and between i guess human constructions and or you know other organism structures so so again what i'm saying saying is be um don't be so polite and actually be uh, a bit more, maybe allow more provocation in your, your project is, can be far more provocative about how things should and uh, be done sort of from now and not to be business as usual. So, so for example, one of the things um, that your edge condition, you seem to be providing is this idea, oh, it can be you know, seats for human beings. Well, I kind of think that that's, that's kind of like business as usual to, you know, um, to how we design shorefronts. I mean, it's all for humans, but if it's really about um, all organisms, then you have to get rid of the, the hard edge to the, the marina, because that's actually, that works for humans and boats, but it doesn't actually work so well for other creatures. So, so again, what your project is showing, you have to re, I guess, re-engineer, reconstruct the edge conditions to make these things possible. And within that, um, why do you need to have, you know, nice lookouts and seating areas for humans? Uh, I guess it's, I'm <clears throat> perhaps I'm being a bit misanthropic here, but I think we've designed for, you know, millennia for humans, and that's given us the ecological crisis that we have. So time now is to actually say no you know 
it's more important to provide uh, growth for corals and for marine environments um, rather than providing nice sitting places for humans to look at it, just you know, to be provocative. No, definitely. That's something we need to start um, developing in the future. Yeah. And of course, as everyone said, it's never going to look like this, right? So in a, this Obviously. environment, it might end up, it might, you might pour beautiful white concrete, but you know, after the, even, even in the construction process in the marine environment, it's never going to look like this. It's going to be patinated with, you know, with all the kind of um, opportunistic organisms and mosses and sea, you know, sea creatures, just the, the force of the, the waves and intertidal forces is going to eat away at the concrete in all peculiar and really lovely ways, you know, you know, so. It's not going to look like, a, you know, a Las Vegas swimming pool. I love, I love this moment. Eric, can I just mention something pretty quick? Oh, please, guys, it is just fantastic to just listen to what you guys are saying. All of you with this one perspective, it is just fantastic. Honestly, it's like taking a class. So thanks, Eric, for inviting me to, to, to this um, to this discussion. Now, one thing that I actually want to point out, and I and somebody actually mentioned earlier, is that these structures that these students are all, you know, uh, designing uh, from the coral growth perspective are not going to be the best just because where they are located. Not because of the design, it's just because where they are located. That is not a place where coral growth is going to be the highest due to the environmental conditions that are existing in that place. Now, what I believe is very, very, very important is in terms of the location, the attractive to whoever passed by to look at that the educational component of this project. Yeah. That you know, someone that just you know runs by that pass by that is actually a very uh, busy, uh, I would say, popular area. I, I personally go there multiple times uh, with my family just to let the kids run in that in that area. And every time there is a new structure, I actually stop by and, you know, you ask myself, what is this for? You know, how bitter it is. We actually talk about it. So in that location that is South Point in Miami Beach, in which you have multiple people that are either um, related to the ocean or scuba divers or like to boat, you know, for some reason they live around that area, having that structure that would attract their attention to to what you know the the actual objective of the project which is coral restoration or some sort of uh, indicative of you know how bad our coral communities are and how much we have to do i think that is key and having a nice well thought by you guys who knows about architecture uh, way 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 more than me i have zero knowledge but having that portion i think that is key and and i really appreciate eric and uh, you know, putting all you know, all these, uh, all of you guys together who knows about this, and I think that is that is fantastic. That educational component, I think, is even more important than the actual core of the are going to grow in those structures. Yeah. I also, um, I, I just wanted to say before I, I can't help it because I so obsessed with this kind of stuff. I love that that little moment that I signaled before. Um, these, this is so beautiful because I usually find that to be the kind of thing that I, that problematizes me and makes me uneasy. But in your project, is so beautiful. That moment of conflict where uh, it's, it's it's still uh, uh, above water, so it's far off from the problems that, that are at hand with the coral. But I find that to be a lovely moment where you are really dealing with this idea of the palimpsest, the ruin, the building over, the resignifying, the, the tournament as the resignification, right, of something. And I think that that's something like that is the key, even philosophically, as to how to keep moving forward with the project. Because your project is about this kind of co-adaptation, this kind of living uh, being in the living presence of co-adaptation and co-opting that selective uh, adaptation or those all that's um conversation is in and, and i think discovering how can that be that even in architecture by itself to me this whole thing is such an incredible discovery and i could i could get in here and talk about that for quite a while i know there is some sort of ramp that take you down in the water there too right 
but we can we we just we don't have the time to indulge in that. But there's there's something quite beautiful in what also um, what Charles was saying in that the, the edge. We're so used to horizontality in Miami, right? It's so uh, idiotic. Where here you can bend this edge, and you, conversely, you can bend outwards, like taking your pocket out of the pants, the the seabed in this project, right? You have that ability. You're so close to being able to do that. So I'm excited about uh, what's next for it. Uh, and we're so good. It's incredible. I wrote that at 4 p.m. The next group should come. It's 4:01. So, so let's do that. And I see here, uh, Chris, unless Chris, you want to say something about this? Well, listen, hey, Eric, do you hear me okay? Yes. No, listen, all, all I thought about this when I was sitting here is I thought when I was growing up in America, there was a phrase, is it a bird? Is it a man? Is it Superman? And funny thing is, because I came in very late, and I thought, what the hell is it? And so I kept asking myself this question, is it a bird, is it a man, is it what is it? And I kind of enjoy that ambiguity about, about it a little bit, that it's quite a lot of things. And I think I really in, enjoyed that in listening to the conversation and constantly looking at the image. I didn't know what the hell it was actually because I came in so late, but it was not finding something familiar that I liked a lot about it. <laughs> that sums it all up. <laughs> That's it. Is it's it a bird? Is it a man? Is it Superman? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's the, the comment, the way the comment comes, is the same way in which the project does what it does on the side. Perfect. I really appreciate everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Let's move on to um, Hassal and Ludo, and, and welcome Christopher Pierce. Hello. Yeah. We're doing so great with time. This is off-putting. I don't. I really don't know. I don't feel good. Okay. Is it full screen? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Ludovica, and I worked on this project with Hazal. So, according to the design criteria for reefline sculptures and modules that Colin Ford gave us. The more small holes and places to hide for small creatures and fish, the more life the sculpture and module will attract. And the more interesting it will become uh, if the holes then open up into small caves to create an additional level of shelter. So we started looking at how modules could attach and connect to one another while creating spaces through the expansion and contraction of the structure itself. Hazal? I don't know if it's me, but I cannot hear anything. Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe it's connecting now the microphone. Azal, are you there? I mean, you are there, but... I mean... <laughs> no, we can't yeah. hear you. Are, are you connected through the speaker? Like, bottom left? It should... It should you, you should select the, the speaker to the computer.
Okay, she's she's gonna try and connect through through the phone so that we can hear her. It's Eric fault because uh, he said uh, he was super happy we were well yeah, on time. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, what's happening? I took a little break. Can you hear or no? I can hear. Ah, perfect. Are we ready? Well, I'm just closing the phone because okay. I think you can hear me over the computer, yes? Okay, I'm this so thing happened. It's, it's a perfect use. I just, I was able to go to the bathroom and everything. Okay, so let's <clears throat> continue. So you didn't hear what I said, of course. No. Yeah. Okay. So first we started thinking of the connectivity between the between the bigger elements, and after making some soft connections, our spaces were generated, and this is our first initial idea that we had. And after we, meanwhile, we looked at jellyfish analyzing. Mm -hmm. Under of this head and create this. Uh, I got yes. Hello. The volume. You have issues, different issues with volume and communication. The volume of the video is too high, so we can't hear you because the volume of the video is. Extremely okay, so low. basically, what I was saying, I can actually stop here, so because we see there also jellyfish. Um, what I was saying is that, so our idea was to create an organization that uh, with the second element that holds a structure together. So when we look at the jellyfish, we see this head and there are other elements that are kind of merged in one single head. And this head kind of provides a protection for the, for the jellyfish elements. So we, we know that there is a, the system that ensures and preserves this integrity. And that's why um, we went on into more detail and so the like looked at the elements that jellyfish have. So we see if we look at the elevation, we see the the uh, jellyfish is composed of three layers of tissues. The outer skin is called epidermis, is the thinner one, and there is a middle skin which is called mesoglea, is the thicker one, and there is again the thinner skin which is called gastrodermis. And under that, there are, there are oral arms and around the gonads, there are four gonads and racial canal and circular canal that connects in the center where there is also mouth and we see the tentacles on the side. And we also looked at the, some characteristics of jellyfish. Uh, we know that most of them are made of 90-95% uh, of water. They, have, uh, they don't have, I'm sorry, a brain. They have no um, a circulatory system, no heart. 
Um, the tentacles serve as a defense for capturing the prey. And most importantly, that we liked about jellyfish is that they have the muscles can contract and expand the body. Uh, that was the idea for our project that we wanted to like more focused on. So this was our proposal, which is composed of two main parts. The bigger hats that are generated with the idea of expansion and contraction and the other secondary elements that are connecting to these heads and create a spaces for fish and corals. And as jellyfish have an internal organization of parts, we decided also to apply a similar hierarchy to the project by making the central nodes or heads the most important part of the model from which then uh, there are connections uh, that can be uh, the outer ones that are thicker and the internal ones that are thinner. And we also analyze some drawings from Leonardo da Vinci in which he studies the muscle connections and we gave importance to the length, the tension, the fluidity and expansion and thickness. And in these other slides, we show some initial attempts of how the connection between modules were made, connecting them both horizontally and vertically. And in, um, in this slide, we found while doing our research, we found out that corals, which are made of polyps, are home to zootantelae, which are photosynthetic algae which we found interesting is the symbiotic relationship that there is between the polyp and the, the algae, in which the algae provides the polyp with food resulting from photosynthesis and the polyp produces the algae with nutrients it needs to carry out the photosynthesis. And we wanted to apply a similar concept into our project in which there is an external structure and, and then an internal one which interact with one another. And so once we were given a site by Professor Goldenberg, we started exploring with the shape of the module for it to adapt onto the site. And the project is comprised of several modules and part of these modules are underwater and they are adapted for marine life and for the growth of the corals. And the other part is above water and it's adapted for all non-aquatic uh, species, including uh, humans and animals. And the structure will have both underwater caves to create shelter for marine life and above water caves to provide a secluded space for, for humans. And as Ludovica mentioned before, so our transitions between the hats were more rigid and straight. And we wanted to make this transition more uh, to give a sense of fluidity and a softness that jellyfish has. So this is a section that shows how the, uh, the inner the elements underground are connecting to bigger elements above the ground, like how it becomes a structure, a part of the environment, and it becomes a structure that actually um, not only for underwater creatures, but also for people. And there is also another section, and this is a perspective view that shows also a kind of a cave that uh, becomes a bench for people to sit on. And there's another section perspective, a long section perspective that we see all the underground elements that are surrounded by the corals and how they are actually uh, horizontally and vertically growing and connecting uh, to the bigger elements. And this is also how the, the project is interacting to the site. So our idea was in the beginning to connect these arms only to the heads. But once it's on the site we, uh, and it's the started growing, we wanted to um, uh, extend these arms and connect on the site. So it kind of also uh, creates the, the support. And these are some views. So in the in the underground structure that we have small modules that are starting from the bottom and then that start just growing vertically and horizontally. It's just kind of showing the aerial view and some other renderings. And we made the the bigger module, the one made for humans, uh, a mesh. 
so that it wouldn't look as massive as as, as it is in Yeah, I think this is the final one and we have the video. I don't know if you have time to play it on, but yeah. you uh, i thank you very much that you was making a research about jellyfish but uh, you don't uh, build nothing that seems a jellyfish so this is the the most important thing thank you that you are not doing a big jellyfish after making a little research of jellyfishes uh, of course you can learn very much about the the jellyfish intelligence uh, uh, and behavior and uh, systems blah 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 but um, the most important is that uh, you was not uh, tending to to make a big jellyfish because this takes us a very bad fame in in the world yeah when we are making uh, this this uh, formal literal imitation of things and not uh, really a bio learning that is deeper thank you eric i have maybe a a, a larger question which is because this is a motif that obviously repeats in the studio uh, and i think somebody already mentioned it before or was going into that direction which is um, the question, why are the projects so incredibly polite towards the existing boundary condition? I mean, they barely don't touch them. Yeah, they're like yeah, not yeah, infecting yeah. them. They're not disturbing them. They're like, like they would be eternal. And, and you know, it, it, I was wondering because if the studio is so obsessed with this sort of biological natural behavior, if you leave nature, you know, if their forces go onto architectural projects that we build, they wreak havoc. I mean, they destroy architecture really fast if you don't if you don't maintain them. Like, have you ever seen that series, Life After People? That's a wonderful series to see those effects. Like, what happens if you leave architecture unattended? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And it's, then it's, you also were talking, for example, about the about the bird sheet. Yeah. Like about it, bird sheet is super aggressive, man. It actually dissolves stuff. It's super acidic. Yeah. So once you leave that there, it's gonna start to react to the architecture quite violently. But what you're saying is like, I know that you want that stuff to happen. You want stuff to do something to some other. But the question about, and, and I, do, I do too, I think it will be important. The, the question about the, um, this border, there's other projects that are coming that I think they, they just are doing the opposite. They're just completely doing the opposite. But so far, many of these projects in the attitude of the students, they feel like when they are given a site, they're given a plot that's going to be, you know, uh, you know, in between buildings, and that the only thing they should do is build within that plot. So it's been already a struggle to to change that mentality. But um, I think that the these creatures are these aliens should be much more aggressive. I agree with you. In in not necessarily aggressive is not the word, but 
much more uh, engaging with that and it's sort of in a way that um that you're suggesting i, I couldn't agree with more that's a great question it's not it's not something that comes from me for sure and also consider that they have only been given this site about two weeks and a half ago so mm -hmm. basically they work about two months and a half only doing research and, and working on a vacuum with their forms to um, site list on purpose just so that all of a sudden you have to you have to you, you have the problem of testing it and you don't know what to do you were creating architecture all of a sudden you're given a site and what the hell right so i think these are extremely polite yeah I'm, I'm wondering also because for example they obviously are dealing with the effect that they create a synthetic form which is then overgrown with corals right and so there is like a very specific reaction between some natural agents and the synthetic agent introduced by the student by their shapes and the architecture. But in fact, their, their own agent, their own forms also should react to what's happening around them in some way, right? I mean, they're not self-contained, I think at least. Would argue. So in, in other words, what is the resistances? What are the resistances that they built in or that they find or what, how the resistances that's, work? That's, a, that's, a, that's something students have to, have to answer, I think like how their architecture actually affects, and you talked about affect before, like how does their architecture affect their environment? Yeah, and sort of vice versa. So how, how they, how about the, how the architectural proposition and the environment work together or affect each other rather than just being, you know, one, one directional. So, so I think, you know, it, it's me, Matthias, that was banging on about being not being so polite and um, and yeah. that the the again this project has has consequences if you take it seriously so it, you have to change it has to engage with um, sort of the context uh, uh, much more um, again I don't know what the word is it's not forcefully but it has to think context just as much as it thinks the object so you know what its relationships what its connectivity is does it <clears throat> does it intervene in or does it modify site and to site modify it? So all those sort of feedback relationships, if you're talking about designing sort of ecological things and you have to take into account feedback loops and how things talk to each other and affect each other, I think really important. I was I was going to say, I mean, I, I, I agree with Esther, Esther is, uh, absolutely about um, about not doing the literal transfer of, you know, oh, it's a jellyfish, so we make a jellyfish. But uh, there is something about <clears throat> this this project and, and its starting point of a jellyfish that did take me in a direction about why why then do we end up with a static form? Because the one of the amazing things about jellyfish is its behavior is its behaviors and the fact that it's it is a, um, something that takes advantage of currents. And so it, it, uh, the way it navigates the oceans and moves in the oceans is again in this relationship with tidal flows and with currents and that, it, and that it uses those currents to move. So it's a mobile structure um, at, and the way that it interacts with its environment is in, a, in that mobile um, nature. So, <clears throat> so I, I was thinking about, oh, is this going to be, again, the provocation of the project would be, um, the expectation is that you produce sort of a fixed static form that is located somewhere. But in response to the brief or a counter response to the brief would be actually no, that's not, that's uh, the best, one of the uh, more interesting ways of approaching the brief would be say, um, for example, it's not about producing more fixed uh, architectonic structures. We have to think about how we engage uh, with mobile environments, uh, with um, uh, mobile propositions. So, so something about the mobility and behavioral characteristics of the jellyfish, I was kind of thinking would be a very interesting thing to explore you know, in an architectural proposition. And it, might, and it might mean that you have to, you know, leave land behind or have a different relationship to land or different relationship to, you know, traditional statics of the architectural project. Just throwing that out there. You know, I, 
I was thinking in a different line. I, I like very much this project. I like very much the fact that you were looking at how a body is working and where are the different forces that are, you know, sustaining the, the animal. I wasn't thinking that Charles like floating, but it's a fantastic idea. You know, sea level rise is here and we are going to end up flooding or perishing or something like that. But I, I really like very much that you apply some concepts from biology and, uh, or, you know, biophysics or biometrics or whatever you want to call it. And then also that you have this distinction and the only way that I can say this is of, of the weight of the structure. Usually some of the other projects or I have been looking at is that they are heavy at land and they are, that's the feeling that somehow, not in these, but in some, in some other pictures you have like the areas that are related with humans are kind of light, or at least that's the representation. Move to the yellow. Kind of, no, further in, if you go move forward, yeah. kind of like a mesh, meshy kind of perspective. This, this section, this section, I, when you were talking about this, I love this part because it's like the structure that is going to be uh, exposed to very um, aggressive if following uh, Eric's language is going to be, you know, ocean, you are, you know, exposed to different pHs, you are exposed to salts, etc. It's kind of strong. And somehow, again, like all the other projects, the shapes, etc., are providing those areas that are going to be attractive for any kind of fish, and it's going to be attractive as a refuge for organisms and as well for others to, to settle down in there. But that lightness, in the upper part, I really like it. And then I don't know if that was an intention or not, but the continuity from the terrestrial to the ability to get inside. I was just imagining children running, if, if they could go and running inside that structure yeah. and they could run and you have some of them like sitting and reading, but I could, this place for me is a playground if a children could just go down and keep going down and suddenly be under the water, but it's still in a terrestrial environment. Like, you know, like those aquariums that you go and you can see and you could have like crystal or transparent, that mesh for me, it's a very beautiful uh, light in which people can be inside the structure and swim and go down. And that, in terms of education, in terms of many other activities, could be fun. That was the feeling, that lightness, I really enjoyed. In terms of habitat for corals, etc., you know, I, I don't have anything new to say, but I really enjoy very much this project in, in that sense. And in, in, I don't know if that lightness, and I was just thinking as a jellyfish, isn't it? They are light, they are so transparent, they are so beautiful. They are creatures that are, and they can be big, they can be huge, but they still they have that strength within the lightness. I, I, I hope I express myself. I'm not an architect, so I don't have that language, but. but, but because, the, uh, I think there's something beautiful about that and a potential for the project to also address what Charles was saying about the mobility. I envision that, you know, I think this mesh is from last night. Literally, they just turned it into a mesh last night. It was solid before, but it's a great discovery of the project. And, and um, I don't think that the whole thing needs to become a light mesh. Neither do I think that the whole thing needs to be heavy. In fact, it's maybe the whole project is organized by almost like neurons, like um, like network, uh, like nodes, right? Nodes, which are also caves and whatnot. Some of those caves may want to be opaque and may want to be more secure and more inaccessible to some predators, but then as the arms leave those caves, they, be, they can become much more delicate and, and wobbly, metal-like things. To the point that then if you have all these um, sort of heads, right, or, or caves or, uh, or helmets like we have on the medusas, uh, but they are not static, but they're rather like floating or precariously hang, held by these delicate arms, then the tide can move things around, can make things vibrate. Maybe that's not so great for the coral trying to grab onto it, but there's so many things we can play with this idea of micro little pulsations or, or, or um, 
perplications, to quote uh, John Brachman, was it? Talk about perplications and folding in architecture. Um, the, the little minutiae of movements that these things can have, little palpitations. I wonder what can do uh, to the life of the thing, uh, of all the ecology. Yeah, I was thinking uh, more or less the same when, when I was watching the uh, project presentation. And I think there is uh, um, all the reference to the idea of contraction, extension, uh, of movement, of motion, of uh, dynamic properties. So I was wondering, and I'm now saying something that I don't know anything about, if uh, there is, uh, there were the possibility to integrate or to create a sort of a, a hydraulic, hydraulic system uh, uh, so that perhaps uh, the, the water can move uh, within uh, your structure and, and be accelerated, decelerated, so that uh, perhaps uh, going out from uh, the surface of the water can be, um, uh, can get oxygenated uh, within a sort of uh, acceleration and deceleration uh, movement. And so that's uh, that was my thinking. And then uh, I was also I have to be a little bit pro, a little bit provocative because actually, to me this structure reminds me to to the jellyfish. So it's uh, it's kind of strange because it has those sort of bells or point of uh, of uh, of uh, acceleration. There are the oral a sort of oral arms point of deceleration which has the bell which are the bells or the and uh, what is sometimes somehow missing is the tentacles so the third system that could perhaps be analogically uh, translated in, in something that uh, can come uh, into play within your overall composition but this is more neurons more than jellyfish yeah, I agree. I agree. Can you go back to the yellow, yellow with with the axo? Yeah, this one, no, no, go forward. This, this is totally that. I think it's becoming sort of something like that. But it's also fishing nets. It's much more prosaic and also maybe negative but positive. I don't know. There's something about textile, something in this image. That is clothing. It's it's fashion. It's it's interesting. Um, I don't know. So one, one, one thing is that I just uh, want to mention about this is that if you have meshes on the water, because they are going to get they, they are going to get covered by microalgae like right away, and since they are going to be moving, the uh, herbivore fish will not feed on them, and you will end up with something pretty green on the water that is going to help. You know, if it actually gets covered by microalgae, it's going to block the water flow. So we should think about maybe something that is a mesh, but it's fixed. Uh, maybe a metal mesh or something different, but it cannot be because that's that's what I, that's what actually happens with uh, with uh, uh, abandoned uh, fish fishing nets that get yeah. on the water, get covered by microalgae, and since it is moving, the uh, herbivore fish will not actually feed on them. And what happens is that sometimes fish actually get trapped in them. And they will uh, that would definitely not be a good idea. But sexy. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for the comments and thank you, um, Hazal and, and Ludo. Thank we you. are we are now about mm -hmm. to start the last batch of three projects. We're we're moving swiftly along. So uh, I'll invite Claudia and Clifford to so go ahead. <clears throat> Welcome, Alessandro. I see you. There's some weird hearing into the background, but you're there. <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool. It looks like the wire of the... You try it. No, it doesn't work for me. My camera is pretty crisp. <laughs> Perfect. Look at this. There you go. Oh, I, see. I am blue, so maybe this works. Riders and everything. Adidas. Are we ready?
Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. So um, this is Clifford and my partner is Claudia. Um, there's three important factors that affected our project. It's the mucus, the environment factor, and the choriocilia. The mucus, we look, at, we, look, we look at it in two ways, in a biological way and also in an artistic approach. Biological way, um, we appreciate the fact that um, bacteria and nutrients could be stored in it and could allow it um, to, to transmit it to other coral reefs in the environment. Cliff, Cliff, your audio breaks a little bit, so maybe if you speak very closer to your microphone, it'll be better. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. Yes, so we look at the mucus in two ways. First of all, biologically and artistically. Biologically, we, um, we knew that mucus is like a layer on the ocean of the corals that basically merge, merge different types of corals together by sharing nutrients. And artistically, we appreciate the fact when a mucus is dripping out of a coral reef members, it can give you a sense of um, different forms that could be possibly created. So with this in mind, we were able to understand how we have to create some type of maze system that will allow um, coral reef mucus to share nutrients to different coral reef corals. Um, we also look at the surrounding speed water. It was important that um, in a micro scale to have um, different um, water speed to allow the nutrients that were stored in the mucus to travel to different coral reef. And we also look at the cilia, which is a layer of, which is almost like a hair layer on the coral reef, which stores um, bacteria. This influence um, us having some form of texture that will grab um, bacteria and nutrients again, and that will also um, allow the coral reef to be more steady on the structure itself. So we, we developed what is a spine system, which is the main element uh, in our project, that then from this element, uh, a system of the smaller elements are connected to and form, which is a cartilage system. And this together, these, these, these two main elements branch out and create what is uh, the, the main uh, unit of our project, uh, which is composed of Three, three bundles, three elements that they connect together uh, with, with a clipping system. Mm -hmm. And so this, this unit is then further explored in terms of uh, sections drawings um, as seen in this image in which it allows us to observe the macro environment of how the, the fish uh, can, can uh, work with it. And so it, it shows the, the progress of, of certain uh, uh, spaces uh, within it. And so in this renders, one can see better the, the texture that was mentioned before, how it is implemented and explored with, with, the, with, uh, with the colors of, of the project that are, are these colors are are based on know, knowing how, how deep they go into the ocean of 30 to 50 feet, which is, allow, is a, uh, allows fish to, the fish can see this color from 30 to 50 feet down. Um, and so then they're further also explore, yeah. they're, they're further also explore um, with the sketches that are developed, uh, allowing us to, uh, um, expand the model, the structure, into what is uh, ground level, and so, okay. and so it is. It is. De it is developed. Um, you want to take it out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you want to take it? Yes. So basically, um, like Claudia was saying, these sketches they allowed us um, to take the project from the seabed to the ground level, and the seabed itself, the structure works for the fishes, it's calling for the fishes, it's calling for the bacteria, but on the ground surface, it's calling for humans. So it was important for us to have, like Vila said, to have the colors in order to call humans and to call the fishes on the seabed. The reason we choose um, 
um, green, yellow, and blue is because these are the colors that from 30 to 50 feet that fishes can see underground. Mm -hmm. And we took the colors and we also make sure that it smoothly went to um, the mm -hmm. pavilion itself in order for it to call humans mm -hmm. itself. And um, so basically on the ground level, it's able to create different spaces where you can have um, different um, LED screen where humans can understand um, education for educational purpose. Mm -hmm. And also the skin itself does appear on the ground surface. And it basically allows the human to understand what's going on, on under the sea, what's going on on the seabed itself. Yeah, you can here, yeah, you can see the seabed. And it also um, works in a way where it becomes, um, where human can engage with it, where human can sit with it, where human can touch it and intertwine with it, just the way that fishes will intertwine with it um, under the ocean. Um, so we made sure that the continuation of the um, structure on the seabed and the structure on the ground would be one continuous project that it would then be separated and fishes could be and where corals um, could also grow on it. And um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, this, um, so the colors that are seen here are mostly to attract uh, what is the underground to attract more of the people to work as Clifford mentioned before to work more as a event so they're more neon colors more futuristic you, we, you can see also the scale of the human towards it and how humans they feel enclosed in the space just the way that we repeated that fishes would feel enclosed of it um, under the under the ocean and you have some surfaces that are more wider where um where where we would put the where, where, LED screen. Where the, yeah. where we put the LED screen. So, so this is um, a render that shows um, at, at night how it would look like um, in terms of event and how um, the different spaces are put throughout the project. And this is about the intent to uh, a 3D printed model of the unit prototype. Um, and so one can see uh, the attempt to the texture that are, that was placed on it, and and how the the members they connect with each other and how they intertwine with each mm -hmm. other. Thank you. Maybe you can cycle back slowly yes. through the images, slowly, so stay a little bit in each image and keep going. So we are reminded of what we saw. So uh, I think it is uh, really, really interesting. And uh, I actually would like to know more about uh, the relation between uh, uh, aquatic life and uh, colors. So I think in your uh, uh, next presentation should uh, give us uh, more information about this because I think that we are, we are all uh, really curious about that. And uh, and I think this uh, I, I, this is the core part of uh, your project, which is again uh, at least for what concerns my personal uh, uh, interest, uh, the really really uh, uh, I'm, I mean I'm really curious about that the the idea of uh, of the non anthropocentric. Uh, visual performance of an architectural structure, it's really appealing to me. And the visual performance of an architectural structure in, uh, uh, for the aquatic condition, it's, uh, it's interesting. It gets back to the idea of, uh, of, uh, of the idea of uh, architecture, what is architecture, what is a non-anthropocentric architecture, and but there is also something more. There is also the uh, the topic of the threshold. 
So which is the limit, which is the boundary, which is the treasure of an architectural object or structure. Because in, uh, in the moment you employ the color, and so it gives uh, visual performance to your project, you amplify that schedule that becomes actually not only the limit of your structure, but becomes the space of interplay between uh, um, aquatic life, marine life, and your uh, designed project. So I think there are a lot of interesting points, and uh, of course the visuals are really nice, the colors are wonderful, etc. I think you should dedicate a little bit more space within your uh, uh, presentation to uh, uh, to describe it, to give us some uh, uh, some uh, sh sh scientific information about that relation, so that we can appreciate more. Uh, the, um, uh, the the quality also of your project and mm -hmm. the the role and the, the function of the color within uh, within the different part of your project. But congratulations! Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Go, Charles. <laughs> I know, so I was, I, I, um, yeah, it's an intriguing project, and I and I agree with what Nicola was saying. I, I really want to know much more about color um, and about how that that works and how you're thinking about color um, and about, I guess, the the visual affect to go back to affect of the your project. How that is. Um, not just applied, like at, at the moment, the, the color seems to be sort of applied as you would paint something. But for me, it's it's, it's more familiar. interesting that the possibility is kind of, is kind of more inter interesting than that to, to think about how the thinking about color actually changes the way that you think about the form that you're generating. So, that would be for me something very interesting because uh, the project looks, um, and I use this word kind of carefully, spectacular. Like it, it's um, that, that final image is really all about visual effect and affect. And um, I, I have some sort of questions around around that. And despite, you know, I agree it's, it's an attempt maybe at uh, non-anthropocentric um, uh, architecture, but the, um, allure of the spectacular seems to be geared towards humans more than it does towards fish, for example. So if it is really about how you're working with color to um, to engage with other organisms and their particular ways of sensing the environment, I think that would be very interesting to hear more about and see how that's driving the project. And uh, this is just a, a, a question, and I'm, I'm not a marine bi biologist, but um, in a lot of the projects, there's the, there's uh, light is used a lot and I just know from some project work here in Australia and in Japan in particular there's a growing body of work around um, the problem of light pollution and in marine environments uh, so I'm just wondering you know uh, is this being thought about at all in this project because um, again my, my limited understanding is that um, uh, for example, in this project, this amount of light uh, at night would have a detrimental effect to the marine ecology. So, just some just some thoughts about that. But uh, I do want to say, any any project that starts off talking about mucus, I think that's uh, really really uh, great. I'm really interested in, and again, the the potential of thinking through again, not literally, but you know, the properties of mucus and the and our relationship to, to mucusy products, you know, because mucus is, you know, whether it's alien or anything else, mucus is usually something that um, in human affairs is associated with um, you know, the inform and the and the various kind of affects and of horror and uh, and comfort and, and unease uh, with mucus. So I, I think mucus is really interesting. And I'd like to hear more 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And pleasure. Yeah. So I kind of, what I, if you're really going to be use, using that either, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, as a metaphor, but actually as a driving principle, thinking about not just the biology of mucus, but, you know, the affect of that, I think you could sort of really gear that up a bit and really play with that. Yes. It seems like Charles really delivers the best lines to follow up with. Uh, there's so much Charles just said, which would be worth unpacking and talking for half a conference, I think. But I wanted to go back a little bit to the, the your comment on the spectacular, because I think the spectacle, I think that's a really, really interesting comment in the light of a lot of the architecture we're seeing here in the studio. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, how do you define the spectacular these days? I mean, uh, a really well-made minimal Swiss box can be a spectacular. So I, I think that there is a, it's, a, it's difficult to, to classify it in a specific direction, even visually speaking. And we all remember very well Peter Eisenman's comments after 9-11 when he said basically spectacular architecture has found an end. That well, because that's the most spectacular event in architecture that could happen. It was a disastrous comment, but it was actually quoting, really shows he that... He was just Sorry? quoting... He was just quoting We the Board about the okay. culture of spectacle. Yeah, yeah but, it, but in any case, I mean, historic events form and transform our views of what spectacular actually means. I think that's very important to understand. And I'm not sure whether the architecture is in here is spectacular, uh, or at least not intentionally, I think. Um, but there is a, a very interesting notion for the integration of what you were talking about now in your later comment, like the sort of natural phenomena, phenomenon like the mucus, like what's mucus architecture. I think it's a, that's a lovely, interesting notion of understanding that there is other agents maybe in design uh, uh, that actually have, allow us to explore design properties which are different to what we normally as humans understand as architecture. And, and that's actually a really valuable lesson from, from what we've seen here in the studio so far, Eric. So I, I think I have to thank you for putting this on the table. I think it's a super interesting topic. Uh, and of course, the, the students' work is, although I have to say, the students' work is spectacular. No, I mean, the way how they're doing it and presenting it. So that's great. Thanks. Cliff, Cliff and Claudia brought this notion of mucus, which I am also fascinated with. And I don't think it has been tackled yet by the project enough. And not at the, not at the right scale also. I thought the use well, of I, I, I think, you know, through the, because I think this is the seventh project. And uh, there are some projects that are really bringing the idea of supporting life, isn't it? And there are some projects that are more like bringing new things for humans. So I, I, I also like the idea of the mucus. And I think in this particular project, just at least for me, the idea of mucus brought fluidity, isn't it? Like, this feels like it's Flowing, is flowing. The different modules are not one very close to the others, but they are flowing and then they build up another one and they are flowing and it's it, it like a clay, it's like something very fluid. That's the idea that I have with this project. So the thing that I was thinking, and might be this uh, general comment for all of the projects, that independently of what was the inspiration, shapes of the modules with the exception of the one that was taking the idea of the church and the sponges, all of them end up kind of similar, isn't it? There is some kind of, I don't know, when I think about plants, you think about leaves and the branches, and then you can build up so many different shapes just by making some branches shorter, other longer, and I'm, I'm starting to have the same feeling that those units are very similar. They have some holes. They, some of them might be light, other ones might be less light, but the, the units are, are, are quite similar. In this one, I think the fluidity is what is very interested in terms of forms and shapes. In terms of the biology, if you can move some of the slides previous to this one, I think the colors are very interesting, but I, I, well, maybe because I'm marine biologist, I love, I love the greenish. But those reds might be, you know, bringing light to night for me is killing nature. So if you could enjoy the night somehow and, and, and not kill it, 
by bringing light where there is, shouldn't be light. Uh, and I don't know how that effect could be using light. <laughs> I don't know, at least in, in, you know, if you want to count bats, because I had to spend all night counting bats coming and going. And, and so you use the red light. So that is spectacular color and, and food reason, whatever the red might be the good one. But it's still for me, if you want to bring nature to humans, you have to bring nature. You don't have to be, bring humans to nature. And night is something very precious that we lost a long time ago, isn't it, with electricity and something like that. But uh, I enjoy very much what you are bringing, the idea of the mucus, the, the, the idea of the cilia, and not the cilia in terms of creating something new, but bringing the feeling of the cilia and, and the ability to trap sediment, the ability to, you know, something that maybe some of you eventually will use also the tentacles of the polyps, isn't it? They have the ability to attack and kill. So they are not plants, they are animals and they can be aggressive and they can kill and they can hunt something. And that is what I'm feeling in here, that fluidity, that movement, and uh, a little bit more aggression. I, I, I feel more life in this. That, that what uh, Stevis was saying about the messiness of life, not uh, somehow I feel that in here. And trying to bring more nature I think could be, and respect more nature could be very nice and, and the colors could be. And remember fish might see in a very different way how the light is, is lost as you go deep in water. What are the, the, the colors that you are losing is not necessarily what the fish are going to be looking. That is more the spectrum of light, isn't it? But very, very interesting project, congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. I find it interesting. Sorry, sorry. Go. I'll be brief. Uh, for the f colors that the fish might see across my mind, if, I wondered if some form of bioluminescence might be employed uh, so that, you know, rather than light pollution, something more naturally occurring. And I also really enjoyed the concept of colors calling both to humans and to fish. You know, it kind of speaks to me of an interconnection of species rather than a separation, which is the source of a lot of our problems. So thank you, uh, a really interesting project. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I found it fascinating the fact that the only one that is desperately trying to talk about uh, form and in a way about aesthetics is the one that is not an architect. <laughs> oh, but she loves, she's a scientist, but she should be in architecture or art. Mm. That's why we bring her over all the time to speak to the students every year. And she, we went diving, she, we went uh, snorkeling and she went diving. But this year we couldn't go snorkeling because of COVID. It wasn't permitted. Oh, I also uh, want... No, I also want to thank the students because this is a really intriguing presentation, especially the dimension of the color is really particularly attractive. Um, there was a question that I wanted to make, but first maybe uh, it's about, so when, you, when you're when talking about the colors, you say these are the colors that can be perceived by the fish, right? Yes. yes. Uh, my question is, uh, I don't know if you said this, so, but uh, this is how the, uh, le the, let's say, the fish can perceive this color, but this is the way they see the color. What I'm trying to say is that, especially, yes, in these images, you can you go back? Yeah, this, the other one, the following one, this one. I think this is, for me, particularly interesting uh, as a starting point, uh, because uh, when you talk about non, uh, let's say, uh, non uh, anthropic uh, architecture. Ale, Ale, one second. Can you come a little closer to your microphone? Yeah. Can you hear better? Like yes. This? Okay. No, when, when I, I was saying that uh, uh, not anthropocentric architecture, uh, I was somehow intrigued by this uh, statement, and I was thinking that it could be really interesting mm -hmm. to see your project uh, not from a human perspective, or let's say from a classical architectural perspective, yeah. but literally from, uh, from uh, let's say, fish perspective, you know, with the distortion of uh, uh, the curves, uh, which is typical of fishes, uh, and uh, uh, also with the color, so not 
not only that way, but could be kind of interesting to somehow in, in, enrich your presentation with also the possibility to show how this perspective from, a, from another non-human species, this will be. Also the colors, they perceive colors, but I guess if it's like, if it's like for cats or for another animal, uh, they perceive this color, but which also means that they perceive uh, the color in a completely different way. So what they see and how they see the environment is completely different. And uh, according to this, it would be also very interesting, and again, also this image for me is particularly interesting, is because you are also working more, more than the other here in, uh, uh, in the micro scale, and, uh, which is, uh, let's say, there is also a point of perspective, but also a point of dimension of the scale of uh, uh, the surfaces, which change completely the perspective. And here we start seeing these uh, uh, these uh, considerations. So I think it would be very interesting from my perspective to see a little bit more of this. I also like the, the, the idea of the discussion that uh, I agree with, uh, uh, with Eric, that probably uh, the mucus and the sila can be explored a little bit more because they are probably the point of contact between the uh, two human species and the evolutionary condition of the project that you are you are building. So what I'm I'm saying and try to say is that uh, probably another aspect that will help uh, in the understanding of your project a little bit more and uh, this course of the mucus will help as well is to see uh, a little bit more in different times uh, what. Uh, this could generate uh, what kind of environment i'm referring to the principle of uh, niche construction uh, according to biologists like naland who has developed this, uh, this this theory uh, the point is that many times uh, as we've discussed they as architect we distinguish what is environment what are the other species and what the what are the humans position in this context but according to lalan and this niche construction this is rarely the case. So what, what I mean is that uh, the human are modifying the environment and the environment uh, as it changes uh, transform or let's say create constraints and pressure so that the humans are not humans anymore in the way we know in the moment they transform. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, this idea of separation is not really existing in reality. And if we, if we build this uh, while we are transforming the environment, uh, we are also creating pressure so that the human in a certain frame of time will be very different, will, be, uh, will need to adapt to this context. So I think that the idea of the mucus and the possibility of different time frames uh, in the presentation will help in understanding how these uh, three systems in reality work together, not, uh, not separated. And uh, uh, one second, last. I'm just was yeah no I was just pointing out the example that help in, in this idea of niche construction so that uh, the beavers transform their environment and uh, uh, they they transform artificially what is grounded but in the in after a period the sequence of. Uh, generation actually it's uh, the environment that has changed uh, is uh, a pressure that changed the evolutionary pattern of the beavers as, as well so let's say that uh, environment uh, biological uh, presence in a way they they cooperate in the transformation so it will be interesting in your case which really goes in the direction to see this uh, fluidity in the process time frame of this project but it's really fascinating and beautiful in the way that this is presented uh, uh, with this uh, condition of, let's say, uh, fragmentation and thinking conditions. Uh, very good. Thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ali, thank you for the comment. I want to segue into that because some of the ideas have been discussing. And um, I like this idea of co-modification co or mutual inflection that Alessandro is proposing. And after, this is a good moment to, to, to revise what the strategy is for the students. They have to move this forward and they're gonna change to a different side and that's a wonderful site. But I, they, after doing this uh, expansion of the module into, into an infrastructural um, and architectural intervention, I think it's now time to revise and go back to the, to the small stuff, to the module 
And I do like the idea of core modification of um, environment to object and object to environment. Can you go back to that image, please, where, where we're at? Because I think you have it here, all these, um, um, you know, all these manifolds that are distributed throughout, um, uh, you know, we have, um, there's a manifold here, there's a manifold here, there's one here, and I've been collecting them. I can show you, they're all around my office. This is exactly the thing that I've been collecting on the beach lately, in my walks in, at dawn, because I think these are fantastic elements that have everything that we need. In your project, the mucosity and the mucus could either um, come off of these sponges or come to the sponges from your devices, from your artifacts, from your surfaces. Mm -hmm. And I think it's this other smaller scale of um, mutual affectation between environment and object, or let's say interchanges, ecological interchanges uh, between the new uh, architectural species grown into the water and the existing elements that are part of the environment or new stranger hybrids that we don't know what they are. If these sort of like uh, manifolds, which are these sponges, um, um, become somewhat architecturalized also, they can become interchanger, interchanging pieces for all the um, new juices that you need to move through your project. In other words, the uh, you know installations that we do in buildings, all the all the uh, uh, pipes and things that we need for buildings, we can discover that there is a new uh, use. And again, the things that are incomplete are co-opted over time, either by nature or because we nurture that co-opting and we can have color move through tubes and we can have any number of things that could um, either obscure or lighten up parts of the project that as needed per the different conditions of uh, shadow overhangs that you have, then they can be compensated by tubes that, that glow and that are coming from these manifolds. Any number of things like this. I think uh, the, the mucosity can be rediscovered as an interpretation of that mucosity besides being mucosity. Yes. Hey, Eric, very yes. quick. Uh, I just want to say thank you very, very much for uh, your invitation. I want to congratulate all the students. This is amazing. I, I'm really, I'm really impressed. So congratulations to all the students and congratulations to you. Unfortunately, I have to run. I have to get to my kids. So uh, uh, happy holidays, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. It, thank you. And, and I'm going to have to jump in as well, thank Eric. You. Sorry, it's uh, just yeah. um, I've got I've got to go as well. But I just want to say, yeah, it's a fantastic conversation, and um, and the conversation has been enabled by the great project. So thank thank you to the students, and thank you, Eric, for the invitation, and thank everyone for the comments. I've enjoyed it, and I'm going to go away into my day thinking about viscosity. <laughs> I think the part of the mucus is you know the stickiness. And it's and and I just keep thinking that stickiness is coming kind of become sort of um, sort of uh, a bit of jargon word in lots of realms of design about how you design stickiness in, into into objects or to architecture or environments and it's about how things you know uh, are brought together but how things stick and stay connected so all that all that all that conversation around mucus I think is just you know a great great thing to think about. And, you know, the coinage of mucus architecture or, or a mucus environment. I think that's really, that's you know, something that can be very pleasurable, but also, you know, it has, has um, all kinds of other elements of effect in it. I think that's really great. And for me, it's about touch and about the senses. I think that's really great. So I'm, I'm going to stop. Forget, right just don't Thank forget, Charles, that mucus is a source of food. It's one of the major sources of food yes. in the world. So that's, that's right. also Something that yep. not <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Yep. I wish yep. to match okay. you, you team with HR Geiger creatures. <laughs> we'll Thank you all. I must go as well, but it was wonderful and uh, look forward to future conversations and work. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I, I, I unfortunately I have to ask this part as well. We were ending at five. You're going to miss some of the better ones, but, but it's okay. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I have a few other things that well, I'll share. So I'm going to leave it on and, uh, and I'll be listening. I have to do some things around the Coral Lab. We'll coordinate and share the rest of the presentations with you later.
Thank right. you so much, guys. And guys. Thank you. We'll continue with um, Brian and Sophia for the last two projects. And with whoever survives of the viewers. That's why I plan to have so many because they begin to peel away, peel away with uh, when they need to, and it's understandable. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Sofia Cabral, and my partner, uh, Brian Castillo. Uh, we worked on uh, this project that we are calling an autonomous organism. Uh, the idea behind this project is to have a self-sustaining, uh, to make a self-sustaining organism. Uh, our design was considering and uh, to enhance uh, coral reef reproduction. This project is not a module, it's a system, an imagined system to optimize the proliferation of coral and its dependent species on a multitude of scales. Some of the methods that we used uh, in order to achieve this system, uh, we re it was important for us to, um, to be mindful that in nature, uh, a lot of things happen at once. Uh, it's not a linear way of, it's not a linear process, which is uh, unlike the way that a lot of architects work. So it was important for us to uh, integrate a lot of different processes, uh, as many as we could throughout this semester, uh, including uh, these that are shown in this, um, in this graph. Uh, some of our, uh, the drivers for our design uh, that we tried to achieve were diversity, detailing and complexity, and adaptation to the surrounding. Uh, so Brian's going to talk a little bit about our research. So, um, so during our research, uh, we came uh, across um, this many, uh, can you go back? many that there, we realized that there's a wide variety of uh, corals and some of them are extinct and some of them are in the verge of extinction um, and we see potential in, um, um, in these corals in order to um, inform our design and um, like uh, the scale, the form, the texture, the texture that it has, the grooves in how uh, they adapt and transform um, the environment around it and how they arrange and start to create colonies and um, eventually rifts. So uh, not only the, the like, Sorry. not only they um, adapt to the topography, but they also, the topography um, adapts to these corals and um, like we can see here on uh, some cross sections of the reefs, uh, how they have uh, diff uh, similar components, but they are different in different locations. Uh, Sophia. Okay. So um, also the concept of plasticity was important to us. Uh, if you even if you get the same species of corals and you change the its environment, uh, you get a completely different form. So uh, they, they adapt very well to, uh, to their surrounding. And further, uh, the detailing was also very important. Uh, we looked at the uh, polyp arrangements in uh, coral tissue, and we came across a large variety of it um, that drove uh, the detailing in our design. And and uh, uh, also looking at the species that interact at that scale. Uh, we looked at uh, the, the smaller species and we tried to be mindful of them and create uh, layers in which they can uh, begin to uh, embed. Uh, yeah, uh, and the idea that of growth, uh, the idea that corals grow, uh, that polyps grow on top of their ancestors and a coral grows, uh, keeps increasing in size uh, as time goes. It's, uh, it's so this, this increase in scale um, was, was also important, the idea of accretive growth. And uh, 
Finally, uh, the idea of um, micro and macro scale. So if you looked at, for example, core reproduction, you see male and female uh, polyps are uh, acting on instinct and they, uh, what they are interested in is just releasing their genetic makeup. Um, and, but then when you look at it in the macro level, you see this, pack, this uh, kind of spectacular um, thing happening in which different genetic uh, information is being exchanged between colonies. Uh, and between different reefs. Uh, and that's what kind of creates this diversity that uh, coral reefs have. Um, and some of the drivers of form uh, that to, to drive the forms that we created were we looked at space colonization. So how kind of the, how tree grows in order to create some sort of density. Uh, venation uh, for structure similar to what is in butterfly wings. Uh, we like that because it was a, it's a very delicate structure. Um, the concept of accretive growth for layering, and uh, we got inspired by reaction diffusion, which can see some being seen some corals. The idea of this continuous line, uh, infinite line, uh, and looking at each phase. Uh, of the of the coral life, beginning with the larvae, the polyp, uh, which is uh, the the tissue of the coral, and a agglomeration of polyps, and how they create a coral, and how a coral becomes a reef, which then releases its genetic information. So these, uh, and and it goes back to the beginning. So this process was very important for us at the, to be time uh, to be sensitive to time and scale. Um, so this is the new coral reef. Um, what we are calling it. And it all started by just, we tried to make the process uh, in, to have a degree of randomness. And uh, we picked a cross section, a cross section and we, uh, we repeated it and we started to twist and turn and scale it and uh, see what kind of variations we could, uh, we could begin to, to see. And uh, we came. We what we ended up with, with was this line that uh, changed across its ways. And we, because it has this variation of form, this this cross sections that keep changing um, throughout the way of this line, uh, there are various different conditions that were achieved. And uh, so that was the idea of not only creating diversity of form, but what kind of life can grow within this diverse form. Uh, and then when placing it on, the, uh, on our site, um, we thought about diversity as well and about exploration of how this uh, object can begin to to transform the topography. So uh, what, wherever you may be in the, its geographical location that it can begin to embed in the topography and the topography can, uh, can begin to also potentially respond to, to this module. So the idea of uh, adaptation, uh, the ground adaptation. Uh, so this is another image of uh, how this could begin to pull and push and morph uh, to become part of, to create this diversity of form also in the ground itself. Uh, oh, layering so. uh, to create detail. So um, we wanted to uh, create a system, a complex system that has layer in order to um, promote diversity. Um, in uh, different scales. So here, um, I'm gonna start by the, the, the most inner layer, which is the, the dense core. And in this core, um, is where life begins to start to um, uh, promote uh, the, uh, the process of, um, of, of life. And um, this is where microbacteria and microalgae um, will start this process. And then we have the smaller colonies that um, the, the probably 12 inches in diameter where um, urchins or snails can start to inhabit these spaces. Then we have the nutrient um, and reproductive cells channels. These are the smaller sizes um, in order to um, provide nutrients to the, the inner core. And then we also have um, a second size uh, nutrient 
uh, reproduction channel, which uh, pro uh, provides uh, nutrients and um, and an infra infrastructure uh, for uh, the other parts of the, of the system. Then we have the structural and flexible shelves, which uh, serve uh, as um, as a niche for uh, for other animals to uh, create um, uh, a habitat there. Uh, then we have a uh, penetrable uh, porous skin, which uh, can be um, accessed by only animals that are one eighth of an inch. Um, then we have the larger colonies that are, are around 24.5 feet in diameter for um, bigger um, creatures. And finally, we have uh, the structural veins that uh, help the structure um, in different parts of the system. So beginning with the core, as Brian spoke, it is where the proliferation of life begins. And that's where the micro, we we're thinking about the micro um, proliferation of life, so bacterial growth. And that's why we created this dense a dense core and which has a lot of various niches inside. And that core would be uh, held by the flexible tubes, which we'll go into. So we were thinking about how growth could begin to happen within this core. And we ran simulations of reaction diffusion um, and how this could begin to create this densely knit core, but still with the, with the niches that we were looking for. And also with space colonization uh, that also created this intricate uh, density. Uh, and from the core, it would be the, where the life would begin and the polyps uh, and the, the smaller colonies as we spoke about would begin to grow. And these colonies for, uh, would be housed uh, would have houses for um, for the flamingo tum, for example, uh, in smaller life, uh, and then from them on, it would just continue to grow and grow until uh, it, it reaches bigger colonies. And this is again with the process of uh, accretive growth that we looked as in corals grows, and they have these these rings of growth. So um, we were. So, uh, searching for the same type of thing. Uh, colony tissue, um, we of course imagine that these colonies would have uh, several different types of pinches and uh, openings and, uh, in and intricacy uh, for the interaction of, um, of animals. And it creates this arrangement um, that we were we were trying to achieve, uh, kind of copy the coral arra uh, uh, tissue arrangement. And then in the outer skin, going back to the idea of plasticity and how, um, how if you're changing the core from one environment to the other, it can complete, look completely different. Uh, so we 3D printed one of our first iterations and we scanned it. And with this, uh, and with that scan, um, we put we were able to put it back into the digital environment and see how this change in environment could show a loss of information, and put or or gain sometimes. Um, and we put it back onto the module and it created this uh, kind of blurry and interesting um, skin. Uh, and we also run a, a structural analysis. Um. So uh, we started with um, initial geometry uh, that was derived by uh, the subdivision of the, uh, the skin by the intersection of, uh, of the channels and the flexible uh, shelves. And this allowed us, allowed us to, uh, to have a skin that um, to run a structural analysis. And this uh, analysis was run by a, a software called uh, Caramba. And the analysis um, allows us, uh, it shows us uh, where um, the um, areas of more need are. Uh, where, um, yeah, the higher stress and deflection uh, happen. The next. So, in here, we can, um, so to solve this problem, um, we wanted to introduce uh, structural beams. Uh, which uh, were inspired by the high structural capacity um, in nature, in nature, such as um, butterfly wings. 
and it provides a delicate yet resistant structural uh, re reinforcement. Um, so on the top uh, diagram, we can see uh, where the but some areas in the red where the high high stress happens, and in the bottom we can see how the uh, structural bands start to um, aid the the structure and um, um, to yeah to help uh, support the structure. So in the in the end, we were we were looking for that same kind of delicacy that you can see in butterfly wings. And the main purpose of this is to have a working machine. Uh, we wanted to create, we wanted those channels to be functioning and for them to uh, distribute reproductive cells throughout it uh, and have the, the ability, for example, for uh, coral egg and sperm to float through, the, through those tubes, uh, create a larvae inside of the colonies and uh, settle uh, on its surface uh, in order to direct uh, um, coral reproduction because as when spawning happens, uh, a lot of genetic material is lost. So what if from Marlio colony, uh, reproductive material could be sent to Dixon Depths colony and then to Circumfluent colony and this could just keep flowing endlessly in a more directed way and, uh, and there would be uh, more creation of, of larvae. Uh, and ultimately to create this kind this seamless um, interaction between uh, between if you were to put it on the site between humans and between land animals and also uh, sea animals. Uh, so what if we started as humans, we started to see corals the same way that we see trees, uh, if they were as visible to us, uh, then if a lot of them were missing, uh, we we would we would actually see the change and be more concerned about it. Um, so this is just another example of it on the site, um, how we could begin to uh, take over that inlet. Uh, and we gave priority, of course, to the ground uh, and how this thing could begin to be snuggled by the ground, um, this, this new coral reef. Um, some images. And the, I know there was a lot of talk about light. Uh, so one of the ideas that we had uh, was that this could be an indicative of coral health. Uh, we picked this purple light because uh, it, it's not harmful for coral and life around it. Um, and we were imagining something that could call for attention and could be a cry for help as someone is uh, uh, looking upon this. Uh, so th it may be the brighter it glows, um, the more help the waters are in need of. Uh, so it's a way of us seeing the coral and the way that we see trees. Um, so this is another image of it. And uh, to finalize, it's just a, a little walk through of the glowing and that is it for our presentation. Well, it was impressive, no? I, wow. A That's lot of, of research and a lot of, of purpose uh, of things to do. I don't know if this really will work or not because uh, biologists needs to, to say this, but, uh, but it's really impressive. No? This, this, is, this seems real. So, uh, mm, because when we were speaking about the other things, uh, mucus and all these things, um, we need to, to think at the end architecture as something that um, not only it's a desire, it's a dream, it's, we need to think how to do real. And this is the, 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 the big challenge, how we want to do, uh, to, to arrive to, to, to the reality of, of our ideas. 
when dealers coffee you want to do a, a cloud uh, uh, they do a, a real uh, the blur a, a real cloud of of real uh, vaporized water and and this is the the the, the, the big challenge no the, the um, so if we want to have um, mocus architecture we need to do real real absolutely real mocus architecture i was um, i i wanted to to make in at, at home uh, my corridor in in uh, in uh, black long hair uh, but my wife don't uh, didn't let me to to, to do this but uh, it is 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 what i wanted to do uh, something with real long black hair mm? Of course, this makes uh, someone afraid of, about the reality of this. But uh, um, every time that we say something, we need to think how we want to do it real. If not, architects will be very, very few, uh, very, what is no, no, what, uh, very devilish, devilish. Uh, what is devil? So, Do you? Uh, yeah, no. Diminish. So and and uh, but when we are doing some uh, realities, this makes makes us very strong. And uh, so I hope you can do this in the reality. But but what you're saying is important from an ethos point of view for designers and architects. But I, I know what I know that what you're saying is not to tame this, uh, to domesticate this, but to actually find a way to do this. I know that's what you're saying, Alberto. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You you that's can the imagine fear for the students. <clears throat> but at the end, also because sometimes we we speak about anthropocentric and and this and uh, this is now, uh, but mm, we we don't need to fear anthropocentric folks because uh, architecture is is anthropocentric. Mm, architecture. Only is anthropocentric. If architecture is, is not anthropocentric, it's not architecture. Is the constructions that the builds do or the corals do. So, um, uh, but from the other side, um, in nature uh, don't need us. So, um, thinking in anthropocentric uh, is is something also. Um, I, I don't know how to, how to explain. Eh? Um, uh, when we think in, in when we don't think in anthropocentric, um, we are thinking in uh, as nature think, but we are not architects. We are as 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 animals. We are engineers. We are scientifics, but not architects. Eh? I don't know uh, how to to explain this better. But did you just say that engineers and scientists are animals? <laughs> are, well, not not scientists, but the, obje the objectivity of of what a scientist is developing is the objectivity as uh, as animals are are uh, making things. So they don't need to to see or to give value to something spectacular, elegant, beauty, uh, futuristic. All this is, is anthropocentric, no? Uh, Let me and, and with you, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, uh, Brian, can you circle through the images as we are developing this conversation so we can keep thinking about what you did? Yeah. Slowly. No. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Are are, are you? Uh, you were going to develop other ideas, or can I go? You. Oh. I wasn't going to talk about it. Okay. That's so I, I think that we scientists have the anthropocentric mistakes about looking reality. We have the senses of any human. We don't have other senses to sense and to plan. And we keep talking about the elegant design of an experiment. We keep talking about the beauty of the design of an experiment. We talk about all of those words, and, and that's what keeps us less objective. And those are part of our problems, isn't it? We try to understand nature with our very human senses. 
we don't we don't see like a fish see we don't feel like a plant that is going to sense the light but anyway in this work brought me really to the word restoration some of the biggest issues that we have with restoration is that we are bringing the structures but we are not bringing the biology we are not bringing the bacteria we are not bringing the algae we are not bringing all of the other elements that make an ecosystem an ecosystem is indeed and then we fail dramatically how many failures we have in terms of restoration and you can see all the different shapes that they have been trying you go to jamaica you go to different places there are some other places that are having that because they are thinking the thinking that you are bringing from different scales sofia can you move on forward and stop there sorry no back uh Yes. Keep going, Ligia. Don't mind me. I just. I oh, okay. Okay. So what, what I'm thinking is that you are bringing uh, really the ecosystem perspective, and the ecosystem perspe perspective is made by different scales. There is no way that you can see biology without seeing scales. And, and when I talk a scale, I'm talking about a scale in time and and a space. So corals, corals might be a unit that might live 200 years, but a coral reef, we're talking about really long time. So the coral reef is geological time. A coral is an ecological time. And, and the scales can be something that are very hard for us to understand. And I think that this project is bringing that, even though from the perspective of the view, the, the, the looking, it's heavy, it's kind of heavy, but if you are diving in a coral reef, coral reef is heavy, it's, it's humongous. It can really support a hurricane. Isn't it? It's going to be reducing the wave from 30 meters to five meters. So those other beautiful, wonderful, futuristic, modern and whatever structures are going to fly, they're going to be look, look. But this one, I, I, I think is bringing nature in its strength, beauty, uh, ugliness, complexity and different scales. So um, my brain is fried, I'm hungry, tired, but um, anyway, I think that, I don't know, you architects are going to talk about all of the other areas, but in terms of the biology behind the project, I think that you are bringing really, not only the fish, not only the beauty about that, but everything that encompasses the cold reef. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ligia. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, go, Alessandro. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just, I just want to confirm that, yes, Ligia actually said everything that I thought. So this project really uh, brought the also the presentation to a, another level because really all the discussion I was doing before also the, the, the inclusion of scale and time and deep time in the project I think we have seen here very clearly so this was uh, definitely an advancement in the, the idea of what is uh, an ecosystem and how this can uh, can be linked to an architecture I also like the references to the randomness what I would say more serendipity, the concept of diversity, redundancy, variability as element uh, of the ecosystem, the plasticity. Uh, so really, I was really impressed by the quality and the, the fact that this project is strong, and even more about the fact that, uh, uh, if I can say this, it, what, the more you go deeper, the more you understand how this works, the more the project looks beautiful. I mean, there is a clear pleasure in our human brain in understand uh, intuitively what, uh, uh, let's say, uh, something which is ecologically appropriate uh, is give also a sort of level of pleasure, if we want. This is also reminding me of the discussion about the uh, scientists and architects, also that uh, I remember this anthropology saying that from the point of view of the pleasure of the creativity uh, it's incredible incredible to notice that uh, 200,000 years ago we developed this pleasure and uh, from this perspective science and uh, uh, art is exactly the same so we think that somehow science is more linked to, to this uh, linear thinking but uh, 
uh, it is uh, a product of creativity as much as art, according to these uh, paleontologists, which in this case give me a clear example, because the beauty, the beautiness of this presentation, the, of this project, is so much uh, related to the quality of the uh, research uh, and the knowledge also from, uh, how can I say, scientific point of view, it's kind of kind of impressive. Um, maybe the only note, uh, only comment uh, that I will consider, I, I appreciate the use of Caramba for doing the structural. I'm wondering if uh, uh, you have uh, uh, considered this in the in, in a water environment, if this is appropriate, because Caramba works a lot with structural system that uh, uh, deal with gravity. And uh, if uh, in this case, you have also considered the influence of fluid dynamics. So if you tested Caramba after uh, uh, fluid dynamic uh, simulation, or if you consider to do this, or if I'm just wrong and you have just considered these aspects, uh, uh, but this is a little bit by side. Really congratulations for the presentation. Thank you. Mm. Uh, yeah, I wanted to congratulate with you it's uh, it's uh, an impressive amount of work and uh, and the te technically visually uh, narratively uh, consistently it is uh, it is uh, an impressive work of course uh, it, it is not a speculative project. It is a hyper speculative project. But I think it is something that is needed within, uh, within the work that we have seen today uh, because it's, uh, it takes uh, different directions. Uh, for what concern, uh, what I love more, it's uh, the attempt to achieve diversity within continuity uh, you have a continuous system, sort of uh, uh, animation or, or extrusion uh, with the rotation, etc. But then this system, this structure start hosting a subsystem which are different, which are not actually a, uh, a differential system of the main overall system, but they're really different and they're hosted inside. So you have all these uh, uh, moments within the narrative of your project that uh, uh, are, are like uh, completely different rooms in a sort of way. Of course, and then of course, it's uh, the amount of work, the amount of research uh, the, I, uh, as a student, I, I understand that you have been employing, l learning, employing a lot of digital tools and digital techniques and digital strategies. You, you can, we can see it. You have producing, uh, you have been producing an amount, huge amount of work. You have a 64 beautiful slides. When I present my work, I usually have uh, 80 slides. So it is all my life work. And, uh, and just to bring it in perspective, um, of course, all these hyper research had uh, happened by, as you were actually saying, layering by adding, adding, adding. And sometimes you, sometimes with the implementation. So I think that at a certain point in the, within the next project, you should learn how to, uh, to implement your project by adding techniques, adding research, but not by layering. So adding in more information, but making more dense the information that you already have. But this is a different story. It's gonna be like in the future. I think that you don't have to like uh, uh, um, lose what you have. I think that if it was me at, a, at this point, at this stage, I would like choose a chunk, 
the section of your project instead of keep working on the overall system and try to work on the, as, uh, as um, SLS was saying, on the constructability, on the possibility to, to make it real and to make it, uh, to understand how it could work in a, in a real condition. But again, congratulations for your incredible work. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to offer that. I mean, a lot of the things have been said that there's so many things one could say about this project. I think it, the project is, is, um, is extraordinary. Um, and I was looking at these drawings that um, not only the project does what it does well on its own as a thing, but it also found a way to kind of uh, park itself there and maybe park itself there and, and had an impact on the environment in doing so, was affected by the environment and then left, right? That the creature left. And I, I'm reminded of the kind of fossils one finds in, of coral. And they're usually, um, they have parts where creatures were in them. Maybe they were thousands of years in them and left or died. Worms and things like this that cut tunnels into them and whatnot and leave a trace of their activity. And that could be an activity of hundreds or thousands of years, right? Because these things are eternal. And this is what this reminds me of. I find these drawings to be extraordinarily architectural. And they speak to me about the notion of trace. Trace is a is something I'm very fond of since I worked with Peter Eisenman. And we can talk about that in another situation in the next semester. I think it's an important notion for architecture. But given bringing it back to this project, I also want to offer just a simple thing. Um, the In Argentina, there was this architect called Amancio Williams. And uh, he was a disciple of Le Corbusier and also reached very high levels of poetic um, uh, dimension through his work, built work, and unbuilt work. I'll show you. But one of the projects he proposed was the housing complex that humanity needs, la vivienda que la humanidad necesita. So that uh, level of um, that level of optimism, right? Like uh, Plan Obus from Le Corbusier or other projects like that that proposes super mega structures that that were needed by humanity right so the housing that humanity needs i actually think this is not a housing project right but i think this is the housing that humanity needs and it's not for humans but maybe humans can interact with it boom <laughs> you're not definitively right Eric. this project give us the opportunity to say what we can learn from this, let's say, in a more extensive uh, field of research about uh, human habitat. Yeah. Adding, adding to that, I just have a question to the presenters. Um, going into your thesis here, how do you see this project? Because to what Nicola was saying was very accurate. What part of this should you, you know, would you like to um, I could barely hear you. you come uh, and go. Can you come closer? But I, I heard what we expect to do moving forward with the project. Yeah, exactly. Which part of what Nicola was saying, which part would you, you know, take as something to really focus on? The girls you showed, you know, and it really needs to involve research and, uh, and, and, uh, and these ideas to a set of drawings. Um, well, moving forward, um, I would like to fabricate it. <laughs> um, so well, you're talking to an expert fabricator. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, right well, well that, that, that's that's great because I think it's it's definitely I think you learn a lot by uh, by by moving into that scale of uh, your hand actually reacts with the digital tools that you've obviously employed to come up with the with the idea and then and then materializing that. I think they're really, they're really addressing what Eric was just saying is that maybe this is an architecture for, for not to do this, but it is related to that kind of consciousness or the, the biological, um, you know, the, the biological uh, habitants that you were, you know, that you were you know, showing 
the slides. Um, and I think possibly even diving, you know, maybe stopping from this in this and the and next year is actually going into the main of you know, and and, uh, and really seeing how that can be extrapolated. But one thing that really impressed me was your the one thing you kept on saying was that you know, tree corals the same way we see trees. And yeah. I think from an from an activism type point of view when and this idea of this working machine and then the light that is uh, you know obviously this kind of uh, artistic approach to you know engaging humans is kind of using this kind of uh, uh, contrast or juxtaposition between you know this this being this housing you know this not being for humans but making humans more aware of what is happening. I wonder if there is a way that this feedback loop can be established. What how can you make this thing in, in a real kind of one to one scale and how that light and, and human interaction and can really kind of lead to a, 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 a creation of an environment and that and the, the biology of the the, 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 the the temperature of the water. There's an obviously of light, you have temperature of the water, you have corals, you have ecosystems. How does that all kind of work together? system of my beach. You know, like they, that, that kind of juxtaposition is quite interesting because you know, the people who are living right next to where your where your installation is going to be are, are quite disengaged with what is actually really happening, you know, in, in that type of uh, you know, what's happening underneath the water, underneath the surface, with the nature the nature that they're living in and colonizing themselves. Um, so I think that that's Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Brian and Sophia. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one, one last project um, for the survivors. And <clears throat> that is Daniela and Laura. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we're about to present our initiative, uh, Water Brick, which uh, aspires to work as an underwater reef structure, uh, aiming to restore the dying coral reef communities. Uh, when we first started the project, we looked at methods and strategies <coughs> that have been successful in the restoration of coral. The method that we decided to work with are modules specifically. Uh, modules provide new opportunities for the development and, and farming of corals and can uh, replace structures and habitat uh, 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 in, the, in places where it's been lost. For design scheme, uh, we decided to work with two different ontologies. The first ontology works as a structural system, and this one will help uh, stabilize the module in place and will help create uh, new, co new connections with uh, other modules. And the second ontology will, will work as an additive system that will flourish from the main framework to express the idea of growth and life. Uh, so the second system or ontology will be a recursive growth, which is defined uh, as an in initial condition that is repeated within itself uh, until a satisfactory outcome has been achieved, uh, similar to the process that corals go through. And so for our first uh, structural systems, we decided to work uh, with erosion. Uh, erosion refers to when any type of uh, solid body is physically modified by external forces like waves, uh, rainfall, snow, or wind. And these changes can happen quickly or uh, could take years to develop. We also looked at reef erosion and how different agents can affect the uh, reefs. And then we stumbled upon uh, bioerosion uh, Bioerosion is uh, the breakdown of the outer layer of corals and the processes uh, made or performed by other living organisms in that ecosystem. Uh, basically what they do is uh, 
remove the limestone with their teeth or by exposing uh, acidic liquids. And these images, uh, images show the, the process of deterioration. Now we'll go over uh, to the main uh, factors that contribute into bio erosion. They, um, it is produced by um, microorganisms that, that live underwater, and they are um, they are three we have and they are three main groups, which has a special characteristic that plays into their own community. The microwaters, they um, they're mostly microorganisms like algae, cyanobacteria, and the fungi. Um, they create um, microscopical tiny holes into the surface of the coral, and they can highly affect big coral. Next slide. Uh, the next group is the macrovoters. They erode the internal uh, skeleton of the coral, and their community is mainly formed by marine worms, sponge, bivalves, and barnacles. They increase the porosity into the coral, Making it, um, making it very weak and also very easy to break. And the last group, we have the grazers, which is uh, their community is mainly formed by sea urchins and fishes. They scrape the surface of the coral and they also extract the uh, carbon um, the, from the algae that is located into the coral skeleton. And this, um, on the following images, we can see um, the bio erosion process in the three the three different groups. On the um, first image, um, is a microscopic scan image um, that it shows how the algae affect the surface of the coral. The middle image um, it shows um, severe um, severe erosion into the coral that it was caused by the vivals that affect internally the skeleton of the coral producing these key-shaped holes. And finally, we have uh, the uh, scrape is created by the little fish scraping on the surface of the coral or the skeleton of the coral. In the process of our research, we also discover um, a, a method that is called um, drilling, that it consists on drilling a small hole, a, a small hole into the surface of the coral with a tube, removing a little piece of the coral and um, the, the hole will be immediately sealed with concrete and allowing for the coral to regrow over time easily. Um, these uh, extract piece will allow us to read um, the erosion on the, on the little scan and also the, color, the colors from white to light gray, it will show the traces of the skeleton of the coral. This diagram shows how we um, we introduce um, bio erosion into the conceptable project. It's a transition. It starts uh, from um, the coral as a whole, and then it transits to uh, the fermentation process, producing the result of the bio erosion effect. And so these images show uh, what we were able to achieve with that deterioration, going from a solid mass to a more uh, fragmented uh, porous mass until it's completely broken apart and almost dissolved. And similar to the previous image, this is the recursive growth as uh, it evolves and starts uh, repeating itself. During the design process, we explored the idea of using uh, different 3D geometries for the creation of the modules. And we tried uh, toruses, uh, more conical and rounded uh, shapes and cubo cuboids as well. Um, we resulted in the use of a cuboid as our final module uh, due to its, uh, to its easy assemblage and the spatial capacity that it provides. And so this final result combines uh, both additive and subtractive qualities to the design. The additive uh, done by the recursive growth and the subtractive, uh, which resulted from the erosion of the cubo. And so these next uh, images show the spatial capacities of the module and how it's uh, characterized for having small nooks and crannies for uh, marine life to live uh, in this space. 
and also the idea of how this solid mass uh, made by humans humans uh, was almost destroyed to create a better world uh, for a new type of life. And this is our proposal for sizing of the module. And this is the algorithm that we followed to achieve this, starting with, this, uh, with the solid volume and finalizing with its uh, eroded body. Uh, next, we have a video of how the growth uh, takes over uh, the main structure. And a few renders as well of what we envision uh, this could look like. And um, well, we also would like to share a quick video of the module. We were given an experimental site located in Miami. It's an inlet that it's uh, located at the South Point Park. <coughs> and we also studied the ecosystem uh, and the natural resources and animals that we are designing for. We, uh, we know that the, the site, around the site, we have a variety of animals. We have sea turtles, manatees, dolphins, uh, shorebirds, and migratory birds. And also um, it's home for different, um, in some areas, different corals and uh, oysters, seagrass, and algae. When uh, we introduced the site into the project, we also include the idea of erosion. In this case, erosion of the landscape. We thought about how the erosion process, uh, it will take over uh, human territory. And as a result, we, um, we allow the whole system to take over into the site in order to um, then the humans to correlate and interact with nature directly. The deployment of the modules and the site, um, we, um, they are connected through an aggregation system. And um, the way we would distribute them, it was based on one of the main characteristics of the model module, which is a uh, free movement uh, for non-human hab habitants. That's why they are being very spatial dis um, distributed into the site. Their connections, they are, um, they're kind of arms that are generated from the fam same family of the module. And they allow, once again, for, uh, for um, the module to be placed at different heights. And also since the shape is like uh, cubical, to be placed on um, different angles as well. And by creating um, these kind of like interactions, uh, we are, we, uh, the main idea was to create uh, free movement for these non-human habitants. On this section, um, we try to show how the erosion on the landscape, it create pockets that we ambition to be habitats for um, animals so they can um, interact with the people on the side as well. And eventually we, um, we aim for the system to um, completely be aggregated and take over, over the site and create um, more connectivity between people and the ecosystem. On this render, uh, we are trying to show the response from the site with the system. Uh, people from the site will be able to use the structure and 
correlate with the with the system at the same time creating a solid and united ecosystem. This is um, how um, this is a view how we um, are showing kind of like how the module is taking over the site and how like the the landscape. It's great in these pockets for new habitats. And our last ren render, it's um, it's like the perfect idea world that we imagine for these um, nursery to be. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, it's great, Eric. What I mean, no, they, 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 so they, advanced they, they, through there. <laughs> Well, that, but it's very satisfying, no? This project. There's something satisfying about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, because it's the last, I, uh, I, I wanted also to to give last ref, um, thoughts because we 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 destroy the ecosystems, nature, etc. Uh, we produce extinctions, etc. And we want to solve this uh, so fast as we destroy it. But nature needs time. I, I was making an experiment with bamboos um, and I put in the bamboos the, the you know, this effervescent uh, meat, mineral and vitaminic complex uh, the, that we take in the breakfast. I put this in the bamboos and uh, they was growing in real time that you can see how they grow. It's, it was incredible. It was incredible. It's as when you see the sun that it moves, if you stay without um, be so busy and you stay and you see the shadow that moves uh, in real time, with the bamboos was the same. They grow so fast. But of course, they they dead in uh, they 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 burn they burn uh, because so fast growing. So um, from one side, um, only nature will solve the problems that we do against nature, and only uh, through nature we will be very much efficient for solve these problems. Not with concrete, with nature. And, and architects need to learn a lot more of nature. And um, in, in the last in the project, we, we and, and Ligia uh, say, uh, is, is, is absolutely true. Um, life begins very little, uh, bacteria and grows, and, and, and cells begins to grow in, 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 in as potatoes. And, and later they uh, understand that they need to organize in microstructures uh, because begins to need uh, to, to, to be uh, strong against external forces and, and the structures uh, continues to grow in, in three level of fractals and bamboos is done by little bamboos that are done by little bamboos. So what architect needs to be to do is first go to the microscopical uh, scale and, and to take the electron microscope and, and study when cells begin to be structured, because there is the, the secret laws, laws of universe. And, and um, if you follow this, the, the, the steps that nature is, is, is showing you, we will be able to, to solve our problems. But it's not the problems of nature, it's our problems. Uh, because nature, as, as so I told you, just, uh, we don't need, uh, uh, um, um, nature don't need us. Uh, and we see this in, in the COVID. Uh, time in only two months, nature explodes everywhere. In in all the the, the, the little places around my home was full of, of flowers that I never see there, etc. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Can you go back one image? There is some sort of an axe or that. Yeah. Uh, Laura. And Daniela, congratulations for your work. It is amazing, really. I mean, I already loved uh, uh, the midterm last time we I saw it, and uh, and I love it even more now. Um, so uh, th three things basically. 
One, uh, you you develop the idea of, uh, as we were talking last time, of the brick, okay, organic brick that you can uh, basically employ underwater. And uh, let's say a, a practical or expected direction would be to use it as a brick. You put one on top of the other, you, you create an underwater construction based on uh, organic bricks. But you didn't do it. Uh, basically, you insert a second, uh, a second system, and uh, and that's when the the projects become speculative in a nice direction. It's something that you don't expect, and it becomes entertaining and even more interesting. So basically, you have a, a you could have two direction for your project: one more speculative, that the one that you are showing us, and one more practical. If tomorrow some somebody calls you, I want to make it, you can create the three or four blocks, put it one on top of the other, and you can really test it for real. And it's uh, the, the, the amazing thing of your project, it's, it could be uh, built and, and tested in a, in a real situation. That's the first uh, thought. The second, I love the revenge of the natural. Basically, the natural aggressing the human uh, uh, built environment. And that's that's another lovely lovely uh, act, architectural act, and this idea of uh, uh, you are playing with growth and the and decay, and actually when when we see this, what is this? It is a decay or it is a grow. It depends on the point of perspective. It is a good decay, perhaps from a human perspective, because of this aggression, but it is growth. In natural terms, because you have more space and more environment for. But those are uh, concerning the the project. To me, the most interesting thing, it was at the really beginning of your project when uh, Dan uh, Daniela uh, said, "Didn't call this a project. Call this an initiative," and this really changed everything. And it completely, at least in, the, in for what concerns my point of view, it, comp it gives a lesson to the old generation of architects. Because we are thinking about project, about what we can deliver. Those are static things. You are thinking in terms of initiative, of calls in action, of uh, participation. You are thinking about platform and not of, about tools. And this, I think, can make a hope for the future because you have, a, as young generation, you have a different way to think about action. That is not about delivering project, but it's about organizing initiative. And this is a really the big, the biggest hope that we can have as a, as the old generation of uh, of architects. So congratulations. Thank you. So. Oh. I am incredibly happy. <laughs> well, I wake up. <laughs> I was <laughs> I was in the down of, of sugar. And what Nicolo and Steve said is, you know, it's very hard to follow all, all, all of what you just said. I just got the image of sea level rise here. This is really what is coming to Miami. This is the reality of Miami. And something that I have been thinking, you brought this with the concept of erosion. The concept of erosion is like, how can erosion build up something so beautiful? How all of these are, and, and, and you made that study. You had a very good biological background. You saw the different organisms that can have erosion at different scale, the parrot fish, those are going to have one scale of erosion, but the, all of the other ones, the, the inside corals that are going to have erosion, and usually we think about those as, you know, making the corals weak. We think about our, those eroders are the ones that are going to be reducing the resilience of the, of the, the reef itself and the corals, by, by individual corals, colonies. But then the concept of those forces being the ones that you are using to build up something different is just amazing. It's like, what? breaking my brain from what I think all the time, isn't it, as, as erosion, as 
Is a changing force in land? Is a destructive force in the ocean? But it's reminding that the planet is constantly changing. And when Esteves talk about the loss of nature, uh, the universe, well, the planet is constantly changing. And the idea that this is changing, that we have to adapt because somehow this is not destruction. Somehow you bring the idea of those little people, orange people walking around. So you're providing a space to coexistence. It's not a space of destruction. It's just a space of a new way of interacting with nature. So it's not that sea level rise or that all of this erosion of all that is destruction is going to wipe us out. So that idea of many philosophers that are saying, you know, we are living in the Anthropocene and it's the, the end and we humans are bad and we, are, we deserve to be wiped out. That is not in here. That idea is not in here. And that, the, the, the other idea that, well, we, we, we are learning, we are evolving, we are changing. And, I, and, you know, my skin is chilling because I just finished reading one of those books and saying, what is the new, new way in which we are going to be living with this new planet? Or new, It's not new, it's the same, just different but it's not by destruction. Thank you, thank you. I just love this idea and also bring the idea of a very long time process. Because even though that looks very quickly, the process to get to that level of erosion and rebuilding, are talking of hundreds of years. The time scale is woof, unless you, you actually bring the driller and the cement and whatever, but but it's a very beautiful state, you know, it's mentally, philosophically, uh, visually, uh, and geologically, biologically scales all together working. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. It's actually, you, you touched on something quite interesting about the scale of, of the project, because I mean, this, this image that we're, that we're sitting on and looking at, I think it's no longer I look at it, the more, I'm, I, and the more questions start to arise because it's a very strong concept, the erosion and then the brick. Uh, but then I think the opportunity really is on these, how does this change on different scale? How does the erosion uh, affect different material? Because uh, what I see here is a homogenous erosion of grass, concrete and things like this. In reality, you know, and let's just play with reality for a bit because, you know, it is speculative, but you know, the, the image I'm looking at is something that could be easily achievable as a, as a piece of land art, okay? So if we were to go that, go that route, you know, concrete would react differently to this erosion or this behavior than would earth, than would a sea wall. And I think this it would be interesting to explore if you were to take this, you know, take this avenue on what, it, how this actually could manifest itself as, a, as, a, as an operation. Uh, as as a very much a, a landscape operation that you know that does all the things of of, mit of mitigating sea level rise of uh, of creating a, a habitat for organisms to live in, but I think that if we had to jump from this scale and zoom out to when you know you're flying over Miami right and you you approach Miami and we have this man-made erosion that happens to the west, which is this uh, la uh, limestone mining that occurs between the Everglades and the city and, and Miami. And what happens is, is that it is a man-made erosion where you see it's a, a potted landscape of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of pools and aquifers that, are, that, are, that, are, that uh, are used to build Miami Beach, actually. Um, and there's something, there's, there's a tension happening at that large scale looking at, at, the, at the county level in which, you know, the way that works is that, I mean, the way that uh, impacts is really about the underground aquifers that connect with the Everglades, which is actually related to the health of the bay. You know, there's something larger about this erosion that could be explored, I, I think, you know, between, uh, you know, it's not just, you know, you may take any inspiration from this coral environment and, and, and inside, the, inside the ocean, but I think there's something really larger happening that you could explore and really just really you know compound that narrative to be very something quite strong and maybe just to see what would that look like you know we are eroding miami by 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 on the neighborhood scale and this image is really on a land art scale maybe this 
there's something there I think that could be used to explore, to explore uh, in your thesis uh, in your thesis project. And and I think you know I want to commend you because it's that type of uh, I'm always been fascinated with limestone mining. You know, ever since I came to Miami four years ago, it's like uh, w w something that could really address you know what's happening there and the opportunity of all that you know that area and how that reacts with you know this kind of uh, juxtaposition of the of the, the desire to build up Miami on one side and excavate it to nothing on the other side uh, is uh, is really intriguing. Um, but uh, but but then a uh, really great project. And uh, I really look forward to seeing it uh, uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you. To, to add to what both James and Lihia were saying, you know, I also find uh, a lot of familiarity with this erosion scale that you can see from this perspective here, where it really looks, it actually, um, as James was saying, it, it, it invokes the oolite limestone of Miami and the Everglades and, and the dissolution. You know, of course, that oolite is very porous because of the rainwater dissolving it over thousands of years. And, you know, it, it really, at that scale and in a public park, it really does make you think about all of the geological processes that are happening. And, you know, that, that kind of long time scale of Miami being underwater and, and, and having limestone formed both, both by coral and through, um, other processes that create that that oolite, um, it, it really I feel like does a really great job of kind of combining these two these two worlds of, of, of the water and the land and, and, and the processes that take place. And, and I also I really like the the brick because it's it seems like it's something with with a print file you could actually three D print um, and, and create create something that um, you know has a, a a practical purpose or it could be tested um you know at, at, a, at a reasonable scale which is which is exciting so uh, yeah congratulations on the on a project that, that is really well informed thank you thank, thank you everyone sorry have to go guys i think yeah. you were the last i need to work <laughs> bye cheers thank you. bye thank you um well We've been here quite uh, a long time. I, I am I'm very pleased with uh, with the conversations that we were able to, to generate today because I see I see these um, situations when we have a panel and the and there's there's things to talk about you know, because you produce things that are allowed to talk about. Uh, I see them as creative opportunities. Uh, it's, to me, it's not about this or that or, or this right or that. But rather, it's about these. You know, it's about um, creating something new in the exchanges that we can have with you and between us, and for in this case, for a lot of other people to see because it's been live streamed. So I I want on that note to thank very very effusively to my guest critics today. And um, what's also really nice is that it becomes a collaboration because when they came, some of them came to the midterm and they are here today and this is an ongoing process. This to me is like a quarter or less of what will be done because we met once a week and, and you know, next semester is a studio. It's much more intensive, much more time, much more work. And it's a very interesting program we have, which I cannot speak about right now, but some of you know already. Um, but I, think that I want to thank them so much for you guys who, who took the time out of your busy schedules to become part of this creative endeavor. And I really hope that we can we can continue your creative input to this project in the next semester when, when there's more reviews and more things to, to talk about. And, and I, it's so nice that I also have all these kind of collaborations going on with each one of you. And I know this is a big cauldron where we just stir the pot and there's many more things to happen in the future. So thank you, thank you so much, Roberto, Nico, especially Colin. Thank you to you. Yeah. Thank you to you, Eric. And Definitely. to all you know, the students. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Yes, and uh, congratulations, so. students. I go. Bye bye. Thank bye, you. Thank, bye. You. thank you very much for but, everything. Before us. you go, don't let anything stand between you and a beer. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> 
I I I wait to 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 swim in in your reefs here in Florida. There, yeah. Dale, dale. We'll make that happen for sure. Bye. 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 So, thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank bye. you, Colin. Everybody. That's yes. <coughs> Sorry, I've been kicked out for a couple of minutes. I don't know what happened. What's that? I, no, I, I don't know. I, I've been kicked out from by Zoom, so I was I was out for two minutes. So I don't oh, know what okay. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so I didn't have the time to congratulate with the students, but yeah. Hey, right. thank you guys. This this ends uh, the the sessions today, and um, whoever has been seeing this will find out.